sure this mic is on. Okay, we're in business. Yes. Hey, folks. Hey, hey, hey. My bad. I think I made it on time. I'm not sure. Somebody um, give me my sound check. Make sure my sound is working, please. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? CCO2 said he's getting his hot beverage. Look, I beat y'all to it. I already got it right here and ready, right? And it's hot, too. I just burned my hands. So I'm going to put that and let that sit for a minute. All right. Can you guys hear me? How's my sound? How's my sound? Let's move my chat to actually be in real time. Um, okay, y'all can hear me. Wonderful. All right, so I'm going to do a quick uh, few shout-outs real quick, and we'll jump right into it. Okay, uh, what up, girl Nettles? She said, like the stream to, oh, okay, look at you trying to help me. I appreciate that. Yes, get me in that algorithm. Uh, what up, Charlene, Tia Moreland, Samacha, Soulflo, PBT, Erica Kane. What up, what up, what up? If I skip you, please don't take it personally. I'm just scrolling in and jumping through so we can start. What up, Abby Wise, Nino Show, Nan Nelson, uh, let's see, Latrell Price, Soul Flow. Here we go. What up, what up, what up? Um, EB918, Tyler Hackner. What up, what up, what up? Um, what up, Brielle Knox, Rage Recoveries Clinic? Hey, Calvin, so glad to see you. What up, Locked Love? Hey, Calvin, this is my first live. I'm excited. To be well, 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 welcome. Welcome to the family. <laughs> All right. Um, Let's see. Let's see. Um, greetings from Oklahoma. All right, Miss R. Lilac, nineteen eighty four. Um, Dania, what up? What up? What up? What up? Creativity eighty seven. Yes, Happy Tuesday. I don't normally do lives on Tuesday, but we're starting to. We've been starting to do them a little bit more often. But it is what it is. I feel like I have my camera aimed a little too high, so I'm going to attempt to just tilt it down a tad bit and pray it does not try to reset itself. Okay, stay just like that, please. There we go. Okay. I have too much roof up here. All right. Um, let's see. Candace McLean. What up? What up? Eric Williams. What up, sir? All right. Corey T. All right. I think I've got enough of what's ups in here. Uh, what up, Julian, Steve, Brittany D. All right. I appreciate, appreciate you guys for hanging with me tonight. Um, yeah, a lot going on. We're going to try to cover as much as we can. It's funny because these lives, they get longer and longer and longer, but to be fair, because I've just been working on so many things outside of YouTube, I'm not here as much as I would like to be. So it's kind of like I'm doing the big dump to kind of catch up on all the stuff we've missed. So let's just jump into it. I should have probably just done a Grammy review separately because now we're about to definitely spend a good minute on the Grammys before I get to the other stories. Book Club. Um, on the 9th is when I'm going to announce the Book Club selection. So tomorrow, which is the 7th, I'm going to go ahead and put the poll up for you guys to vote on which books um for the book club i had to, some of you guys sent me some great suggestions we have a lot so i had to narrow them down to about six so i think there's about there should be six choices for you all to choose tomorrow and then whichever is the winner is what will be on our book club right now i have our session marked for february 19th i almost want to push back one more week just to give people enough time to get the books and read because that's really only a week and a half from now so we'll see um i'll let you guys know if i push the book club back by one week. I just want to make sure people that want to join have enough time to get the material and, and be caught up. We normally do the first three chapters with whatever book we start with. It won't, you won't have to read the entire book right away, but we normally, depending on the book I assign the first three or four chapters, depending on how you know big the book is, sometimes we get books that are a lot smaller. So you know, three chapters is only like 20 pages. Oh, maybe not that small, maybe like 50 pages, right? But then there's some other books, three chapters be like 106 pages. So it just depends. Um, so that's that. Also, by the way, listen, side note, this is in response to my last video. My whole life, I've been saying Cindy Lauper's name wrong. Cindy Lauper. Like for some reason, I think because I kept seeing that PH, I was always saying Cindy Lauper. For, for 20, 30, however, however many years I've known of a Cindy Lauper, I've been saying Cindy Lauper. It was so funny because I was reading the comments. They're like, are you saying the lady's name right? And I'm thinking, I am because, yes, yeah, Cindy Lauper. Like, see, whatever whatever the last name is with a PH. And then I looked, and I was like, there's no H in here. Did they take the H off her name? I was like, no, fool. you just been saying this lady's name wrong forever. Time after time, indeed. So <laughs> there's that. Anyway, let's jump to the Grammys. So um, I got a chance to watch most of it. There's some parts I did not catch. I, I missed some of the beginning. So I think Dua Lipa, by the time I got the TV on, she was climbing off of the box. So I missed all of her performance. And I think towards the end, I turned it off. I started getting bored. But I will say, um, I thought this was a better ceremony than some of the previous ones. I wish it would have had a, a bit more of a mix with the kind of performance they had. But I will say, I think the performers they had were 
it was entertaining for some. Um, if I had to do some highlights, my favorite performance of the night, Fantasia. I Everybody knows I really enjoy Fantasia. And the reason I like Fantasia, I said this on Twitter the other day, Fantasia to me just represents the old guard, but in a good way. Like Fantasia is somebody who, she's what she comes out of that school of the, the singers that just show up barefoot and can belt without a mic and their voice will carry through the theater. She just has a certain standard that's there, right? Fantasia could easily fit in with all, like you, you could have had Fantasia be an entertainer in the 60s and the 70s, she would have fit right in. She could have been an entertainer in the 80s, she would have fit right in. Like she just, because she has such a, a massive talent vocally and such a strong stage presence and just this special kind of showmanship that not everybody has, she just shines in whatever she does. I will say vocally, she did hold back a tiny bit, but that's because they had her focusing on the dancing and the choreography. But I enjoyed that. It's just like as soon as I saw her come out, I said, oh, we're about to be in for a show. And I laughed, too, like when she um, when she has the part where she um, goes out into the audience and she's like, oh, I'm looking for some, some lovely ladies to dance and, and da, da 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 with me. And I don't know what woman it was, some 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 skinny lady in the front. And Fantasia looked at her like, what, what, what you scared? I fell out because I was like, yeah, you, you got to come correct because the woman did look a little terrified. Like, oh, please don't come to me. Please don't come to me. You know, it's kind of like, I don't know, back in the day when they used to have the award shows and somebody would sing some kind of power ballad and then everybody would come on stage and they start passing the mic and everything and calling the other singers on stage. It's kind of like being that singer in the crowd that can't really sing. And you're praying to God they don't call you up there to sing with them because you're about to get embarrassed. Kind of that, like that situation. But no, I thought that was a great, great performance. Um, I'm glad they did right by Tina. If you didn't know, Tina was one of my favorites. Um, I always said as far as like, well, she's not here anymore, but as far as living entertainers, period, I always said she was one of the greatest living entertainers that was with us. Like she just, Tina was everything. So um, I'm glad they did right by her, right? Um, so that was Fantasia. Tracy Chapman and Luke Holmes. That was a very great performance. First of all, Tracy Chapman is somebody I know of, but I don't follow that much. So it was kind of good to see her. But the thing that I think everybody we were all paying attention to was just how good she looked in the face, right? Like just like no wrinkles. Like she just looks like, she just looks like peace to me. Just peace, just peace, right? Peace and tranquility. It's like she's at home just growing water, right? She steps outside on the porch and the hummingbird comes to greet her. Like it just seems like that's the kind of life she's living you know, once she kind of pulled back from the industry. So, you know, she was in really good voice and there's just a certain presence about her that just, I can't explain it, but it, it ties into music in this space where it's like, there's some people who really live and breathe music and they just exude it in, in all aspects of what they do. And I think with Tracy Chapman, like that's what I saw when I saw her come on the stage. And I think that's why she had such a warm reception and such positive feedback because I think the industry already has so many ills right? Lots of shenanigans, lots of people with egos, lots of people that are butthurt about everything all the time. It's just always drama and stuff, right? And so to just have this entertainer who we honestly haven't seen in years, just come out with her guitar, you know, you got Luke Holmes doing his thing and she just sings. I don't even, you know, I don't even think she was wearing makeup, right? You know, even with the locks, I don't even think she did the, you know, the retwist to make sure all this was tight. No, she got up real quick and rolled on out of bed and you know, she got in her Toyota Corolla and showed up to the Grammys and said, all right, where do y'all want me to sing at? And she did her performance and probably went home. She probably didn't do no red carpet. <laughs> like, she ain't do no interviews. She did her song and went on back home and probably watched MacGyver, right? So it's just like, um, I don't know. I really enjoyed it. I thought that was a great performance of Fast Car. Excellent. Um, and, and shout out to Luke Cage with what he was able to do as well. I do enjoy a lot of what he's been able to do, too. Um, another favorite... The, it, um, the In Memory of Tribute, I thought was nice. You know, that had Stevie Wonder, who, I'm going to say this, though. I really don't like them always going to Stevie for tributes, because I think at this point, Stevie should be getting his tributes while he's still with us. I just feel like we go to him for everything. He's had to memorialize so many of his peers, right? And I'm sure he doesn't mind doing these kind of performances and stuff, but, you know, it's just like Stevie is getting up there. And y'all, again... I think back to, I don't remember what performance it was, but it was him. He started singing the Michael Jackson song and started crying. This was like maybe a year after Michael Jackson passed. He's had to sing goodbyes to so many of his peers in the last 30, 40 years. And it's like, I just want him to be in a space where he feels celebrated and not always, you know, the, the fallback guy when some people die and we need somebody to sing that everybody's comfortable with. Make sure he's getting his flowers too. That's all I'm saying. But Steve, Steve was good. Um, 
I was really happy to see Wendy and Lisa. If, you, if you're if you a big Prince fan like myself, you know Wendy and Lisa were a huge part of the Prince entourage and the different tours and the different bands. And mainly they were a part of the revolution. But, you know, really great to see them. They performed with Annie Lennox um, in, in that segment. Um, shout out to her for calling out everything that's going on in the Middle East. So shout out to her with that. Um, let me see. The, was it John Batiste? He was the guy that won album of the year last year, I think. Um, I like his segment. You know, they, they did like Lean On Me. He kind of had a really unique approach at it. So I like that he's getting his things. I think he's very musically inclined. He has a very different approach to music that I, I really rock with. So I like that he's not afraid to be different artistically, especially when it comes to men in music, and especially like men that are centered in R&B. They really try to put all the R&B male singers in like the same box. So I like that we're starting to get this, this new wave of R&B entertainers that are kind of going against the grain and just doing whatever they want to do. Right. I do like that. Um, but with that. Oh, and then they also had uh, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. Right. And they brought out uh, Sounds of Blackness to do Optimistic with, with Ann Nesby. Listen, can I tell y'all? I always love every time Ann Nesby comes out on something because Ann doesn't care. Ann's going to get in her runs and her big auntie notes. It, it doesn't matter what. And the thing is, because Ann has pipes and knows she can sing. That's the same thing I'd say about Fantasia. Like Fantasia walks onto a stage and she's not she's not afraid to just open her mouth because she knows what's going to come out. You know, there's some singers who may not be as confident and they don't know how they're going to sound when they open their mouth. Fantasia's ready. And Nesby, always on ready. With Ann Nesby, it's on site and on site. On site and on site, right? Whenever. But it was so funny because, you know, they start singing Optimistic, which again, beautiful song. Probably one of, it's probably in my top 30 songs of all time just for me, right? Great song, but I always laugh because she's going to come out well. And I keep thinking back to um, Soul Train Awards. I don't know what year that was. I want to say 2021, maybe 2022. That was when they were honoring Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. And so Sounds of Blackness comes out. They start singing Optimistic. And it's so funny because, one, Ann's mic doesn't even need to be that hot. Like, Miss Nesby's mic doesn't have to be hot because she has pipes. You don't, but I don't know what happened. Her mic was hot. Like, that mic was set to scorching. So it was already loud. And so the, the, the lady that's leading the song is trying to sing her verse. Anne's going to come in with the Adlers, but Anne's voice just carries over the song. So you have the woman, when in the midst of sorrow. And then out of nowhere, here comes, ah, yeah. I'm like, Anne, Anne, relax. Ah, yeah. I'm like, Anne. And it's like right into the mic. <laughs> this is the funniest performance because Anne is singing down. <laughs> and it's like the rest of the soloists are like trying to fight to come into their. You can see her when you're looking down. What is she doing? <laughs> like, and Anne is hey, 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 just ready. So <laughs> I enjoyed that. It makes me think back to even like Patti LaBelle because you know, like Anne's on a lot of those Patti songs. So I know when I was little, my mom loved the Patti LaBelle Burning album, but she also loved the album that came after that, the one that has um, Right Kind of Love on it. And so it's so funny because when you listen to it, right, you can hear Patty doing it like, he's the right kind of lover out there for me. You know, she's on her Patty thing. But then in the background, you hear Anne carrying all the background. He's the right kind of lover out there. And then she harmonizes with herself. Then she goes in a, a lower key. He's the right kind of lover out there for me. I'm just like, go on, Anne. Go on, Anne. <laughs> so I enjoyed that. I love when Anne be somewhere because Anne be ready. <laughs> I know the other singers be pissed because she ain't about to share the stage. Like, Anne came out there. Hey! Uh, just like ready anyway um what else did i like um miley cyrus oddly enough i was entertained by it. it's interesting because you know i used to cook miley cyrus so bad back in the day um but she's kind of grown on me in the last few years so her performance was cool for what it was i like that she's comfortable staying in her her she has a middle pocket that she works i like that she's comfortable staying in it and she's not trying to climb way up here to the rafters and then you know scorching and, and fighting to, to hold a note right She's in a really comfortable comfortable pocket. She seems a little bit removed from the industry. She's just kind of in her own space. So she's just kind of doing what she wants. So I kind of enjoyed it. And I, I like the homage to Tina or the homage to Tina. I thought that was cool. So that was a fun performance to watch. Now, I'm not going to lie. I never liked the flower song. I used to skip it every time I heard it. But the performance made me almost like the song a little bit. That's something about the song I just never liked. I was just like, it's not a bad song. It's just not for me. But the performance made it fun to watch. Hmm. Oh, um, was it Billie Eilish? Her performance was okay. I like that song. Um, actually, and I really I feel like I just heard that song like two weeks ago. I know it's been out for a minute, but I don't really follow pop music in the same way anymore. So a lot of times I'm playing catch up. So I just heard the song like 
two weeks ago, I was like, this is a nice song. Who sings this? This is different. Okay. And then I realized it was her. I'm like, oh, okay, it's, it's the Billy girl. So then when she did the performance, I was like, okay, cool. She's always in good voice. Um, so that was, oh, I like that. Like I said, I missed most of Dua Lipa, but from what I could see with the box on the stage, it looked kind of cool. Um, let me see. Okay. Burner Boy and Brandy. I just needed the mics to be turned up a lot more. I felt like I couldn't hear anything. Like the stage was nice, you know, great stage, beautiful stage, like beautiful stage. Stage was wonderful. They had sets and everything. And, you know, the song to me, I, I'm not gonna lie. I didn't really, I know he did like two or three songs, but the, the main song I recognize is the one that has the Brandy sample. I never was crazy over that song to begin with because I felt like the, the sample already just carried the song. And it's like, I'd rather just play the brand new one. So it's kind of like I'm listening to that. I can't hear anything Burna Boy is saying, right? And I'm like, you know, I, I want to enjoy this because he's doing a little dance and a stump. And, but I'm just there, just unmoved. And it's, I promise I'm not being a hater. But I just was like, oh, this is doing nothing for me. And then Brandy comes out and I'm ready. And, you know, she already does all that vocal stacking. And there's going to be layers and this richness and everything. But it's like the, the lead mic that she sings out of is so low. It's it's blended so well into all the background. I'm like, is anybody's mic even on? I'm lost here, right? So I don't know. Because Brandy's one of my favorites, too. I was going through my little list of all the people that I've seen the most in concert. Brandy's my number three behind Janet and Jill Scott as far as who I've seen the most in concert. So I was really wanting the brand. I was really wanting Brandy to come out there and do some singing, singing. But that was cool for what it was, um, you know, I guess. But yeah, y'all turn the mics up. And then as far as SZA, turn the mic on. Like, um, but I thought SZA, in my opinion, has become a much better performer over the years. Um, I like that she had this really cool set, you know, again. Um, I One, I'm going to say this. I like that she's had this really massive success with this previous album. And I say that because with R&B, you know, R&B has always had to take a backseat to all the other genres after... I want to say about 2007, 2008, right? And for her to have had the massive success that she's had, I mean, she sold millions of copies of this album, something that's just unprecedented for a lot of R&B acts right now. And just, you know, what Snooze and Kill Bill, these songs that have just like set in the top 20 for like a year and a half, just not going anywhere, that I'm happy to see for her. Like, and I was happy she was able to win some Grammys because she's kind of been in the business for a good minute too. You know, she's been on tour and everything. Um, so I enjoyed, enjoyed the performance. For me, the highlight was whoever the girls were with swords or with the swords. Like, um, as I was watching and I saw the girl on the table and she whoa, 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 watch. I was like, whoa, wait a minute. And I, I hope like the people at the different tables had a warning beforehand. Cause just imagine you're sitting at an award show and you know, there's a performance and then, you know, somebody comes on your table. Y'all were just drinking champagne and you were still trying to eat your finger foods. And now you, you know, they about to step on your little finger food plate. And next thing you know, here's like two blades coming at your face. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, because Janelle Monet like started sliding back. I would have been like, yeah, y'all got to give somebody a warning. Like, you don't know if I got a pacemaker or not. That might th throw me off. <laughs> like, give me a heads up for y'all come out here swinging and stuff. But I thought she had a, a cool, well, that first performance I liked. The second one I didn't realize was like a, an advertisement. Because then I was like, wait, is she performing twice? Because at first I was like, if she's going to perform twice, y'all could have let Victoria Monet get a performance in. That's all I'm saying. But um, entertaining. SZA has a, a, a cool presence that works. I just, I don't think the mic was on at all. Because it's, it's just weird. You can... When everything sounds a little too compressed and there's like no bottom coming out of the voice when you hear them sing to me, it just, I just, I'll say, I don't want to say assume, but I just figure it's all pre record playback, you know, which, hey, a lot of people use it. But if you're going to do the playback, if you're going to do the pre record, just make sure it's a good one. Like, convince me, make me feel like it's live. It just didn't feel live, but it was still good. Um, I didn't care for you two. I've never liked them. So I was good on that. Nice, again, great stage, beautiful stage. I'm good on you too. Olivia Rodrigo was boring. It picked up towards the end, but again, she didn't have to be there if that's what she was going to go up there and do. I'm just saying. It, it, it got better towards the second half when it picked up, but I was like, y'all know how to pick some, some boring people to get the biggest stages sometimes, and then y'all don't invite other people that actually know how to perform. Like, You know what I mean? Like Fantasia wouldn't have been there had Tina Turner not died. That's the point that I'm making. Fantasia comes out there and does one of the best performances of the night, and it's only because they need her to do the tribute, but they don't ever invite her to actually do her actual material when it's time, that kind of stuff. Oh, and then Travis Scott, I'm not, I don't know, his music a little, it's just, there's like a emptiness to it. Like there's just no soul, not the soul as in like R&B gospel singing soul, but like soul as in life to it. It just, I feel like all his music is very dead. 
just dark and gloomy. It's uneventful. And then you put in all the different filters and whatever else he has on it. And it's just, it, there's nothing that just pulls me in. And I get it. I'm not the target audience for some of these people. So I, I don't even lose sleep over the performances I don't like. I just like, okay, I see why I don't be listening to them. But that one, y'all could have swapped him out for a different rapper if that's what we were going to do, right? I, I would have taken, who else has come out with a project in, in the last few? I mean, I know, well, I don't think the 21 Savage, his just came out, so he would have been eligible to perform. But like, um, I don't know. I just feel like there's other rappers y'all could have went and got if that's what we were going to do. That's all I'm saying. Um, I will say with the pre-show, I did like the Kirk Franklin bit, you know, they, cause you know, they have, well, not the pre-show, but you know, they have the ceremony where they give the awards that are not aired. And then we see the, the big ceremony, but you were able to stream that pre-ceremony on YouTube. So I got to see that Kirk always has some really good musicality and he's done like, see again, singer singers, y'all could have moved Kirk to the main show. Cause I feel like what he did at that pre-show was main show worthy and not to be rude. I know Olivia Rodrigo has been out for a few years. I would have moved her back to the pre-show. Since you want to come up here just doing anything, we're going to put you back in the pre-show so you learn how to perform. Um, but that's all I would say on that. As far as some of the politics um, in regard to the Grammys, because I, I, I did see the Jay-Z speech. I'm not going to lie. I did laugh because I thought it was funny. I was like, oh, y'all just real bold. Right message, wrong messenger. For me, I like Jay. I like B. Oh, this is one of my kids called me. I got to call them back. All right. Um, but it's kind of like, for me, as much as as much smoke as Jay-Z gave the Grammys, to me, he's still a part of all of that. He's right in the mix with all of them. He got enough Grammys for everybody and their mama. Same with Beyonce, and that's not a dig at her. But it's just kind of like I 100% hear what's being said about the Grammys sometimes really dropping the ball when it comes to how they acknowledge people or how they celebrate people. Like even I saw Mariah Carey had got some kind of special award and she, even she kind of highlighted it like, damn, I ain't had one of these in so long. And it's like, yeah, it's interesting to see somebody like Mariah Carey go through all of the nineties with only two Grammys and she didn't get her late, her last three until after the emancipation of Mimi. That's kind of awkward. It is weird to see, you know, a lot of people only have a handful of Grammys or not even have any. Right. So with that, I understood everything that he was saying, but I felt like, you know, if you really want to make a statement as Jay-Z, you should have rejected the award. That, I think, would have brought in so much media attention and then stirred up the conversations. And I think that would have carried more weight than going up there and then talking about how the boycotts do this and so on and so forth. And, you know, and like I said, at the same time, Jay-Z has earned every accolade he gets. But I just think because of how people are going to see him, because of the success that he has, because he's a machine and his wife is a machine, sometimes I think even when the message is right, People are going to already be turned off because they feel like you, to an extent, contribute to the problem, right? Um, and then I start looking at it from a different perspective because I'm like, how many times have I, have I said a million times? The Soul Train Awards is right there. And a lot of the people who give the Grammy so much smoke for doing whatever they do skip the Soul Train Awards every year to the point where now, I mean, and it's honestly a good thing for the other acts. You know, this honestly opens a door where you can go and you can go find Alexander O'Neill and, Sh and Sherelle who are going to come and perform because they're never going to be invited to the Grammys anymore. So it's kind of like, I get it. When I think to Beyonce and the fact that what well, she's been nominated for album of the year four times and still hasn't won. And then Taylor got four of them. And I'm like, it, can y'all be for real here? Like, I'm not saying Beyonce needs all four of them, but damn, you mean to honestly tell me that them four Taylor albums, all four of them are just so wonderful and amazing and just better than everything else that was out that she's done this four times. Just like, interesting, right? And again, it's just like the Grammys to me has always been very hit and miss with the awards. And it's the conversation of peers and the Academy and how the Academy votes. And a lot of people that vote already don't even really listen to the projects anyway. A lot of people just vote for whatever name looks familiar, so on and so forth. It's layered. I think people, because I feel like you can look at this two ways. I 100% hear the arguments of F the Grammys, why are we so pressed about their accolades? And then at that same conversation, I understand that for those who work in music or are trying to be in music, having that Grammy or having that nomination, that's like the equivalent of getting your bachelor's in 1991 when it still meant something, right? Like it does open doors. I get that part. I just think too, at the same time, the Grammys haven't, they've done, there's just been too many moments where they've got it wrong. So for me, I don't have super, super high expectations with the Grammys as far as awards. Like my expectation is more so just give me some good performances because I know when it comes to who's going to win, who's going to lose, it's going to be all kinds of shenanigans. People get snubbed every year. People get overlooked. Some people get over awarded. That's why when he said the bit about and some of y'all don't belong in the category, that's when I fell out dying. I was like, all right, Jay, we we here on that. Like about time somebody said it. But, you know, I just um, I don't know. There's layers to that. I just think um, 
right message, wrong messenger. Because I think for because people from the outside looking in who m- might not even really care about the specific awards, it's still going to be like, well, Jay-Z, I don't remember how many he has, but it's got to be like close to 20. And Beyonce has what, like 32 or something? I don't know. But again, right message. I don't know if that's the right messenger. That's all I'm saying. Um, I like some of the things Jay-Z does and there's other things he does that I really just give a strong side eye to. Um, but yeah, I just feel like give some of that energy to the Soul Train Awards. I would have said the BET Awards, but for me, BET's done a lot of really shady stuff too. Because honestly, if I was Beyonce and Jay Z, the minute y'all would have made that joke about Blue Ivy's hair, we would have never been at BET again. You're gonna talk about my child, right? In this era where we're talking all this pro blackness and 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 black beauty and all this, and here we are raising a, a toddler little girl who has natural hair. And see, it's funny now. Y'all made fun of that girl's hair when she was a baby, thinking, oh, they don't ever comb the girl hair, blah, 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 blah. And then here we are years later because it hasn't had perms and all this other chemicals and stuff. And this girl has this wonderful thick head of hair, right? So sometimes it's like, just folks, stay out of folks' business. That I just and jacked up. And then I don't remember who was the person that said the joke, but it's like, who was that? I can't remember, but I swear she wasn't even black who said it. Like, really? All right. Um. Anyway, enough of that. Um. Somebody was asking me about the whole Taylor and Celine thing. I did look at that a little sideways because you know Celine is what I know. I forgot what she has, but she has some kind of condition that's really affecting like how her muscles and stuff move. So just the fact that Celine even came out the house, I get it. People are like, "Oh, Taylor was just so excited she couldn't believe it." But I'm like, Taylor didn't want us to award 612 times for her. This is routine at this point, so it's kind of weird to watch you go and take the award out of Celine's hand and not acknowledge the lady. Damn. I mean, she, they did the good PR and she took the picture and stuff backstage. I don't know. Who knows? Maybe she was told don't touch Celine because because Celine has her condition. Maybe she can't be around people. I don't know. I don't know. But that did look a little awkward. My beef with Taylor is just at this point, you don't have to pretend to be shocked when you win anymore. It, you just might as well sit up there and expect it to come at this point. Just save the act. Just yeah. That's all I'm saying. I'm going to pause for a sec because we've said a lot. And then let me read the comments. Let's see who's mad at what I said. All right. All right. I don't know if I'm going to get to every comment, but let's see here. Also, what does this person want? Um, the governor wants to have a... Whoa. Hey, this is really cool, but scary at the same time. Well, I need to respond to this person really quick. This is one of my kids, and the, and the governor of the state wants to meet with one of my old kids. Let me hit you first thing tomorrow. Okay, interesting. See, my kids are just flourishing. They're doing so well. Love that for them. Okay, let's see. All right, y'all see, yep, the mic was hot. Yes. Stevie Wonder. Um, let's see. Ann said, y'all gonna hear me. Shanti said, Miley's in her right pocket, or her pocket right now. Yeah, she was in a great um pocket. It was, it was fun to watch. There's some personality with it. I think a lot of the newer acts, a lot of them don't have any personality. I told y'all before, there's like a certain rapper, I just, they just, they irk my like freaking skin every time I see them on the stage because it's like they don't want to be there. And they use this library voice with every performance. I'm like, are you even trying? I, oh, okay. Let's see. Julian said, Billy's song is from the Barbie soundtrack. Okay, I haven't seen that movie, so that, that would explain a whole lot. Um, Charlene said, Brandy Slade fashion-wise. Yeah, I thought Brandy looked great. I just needed, I couldn't hear anything, but yeah, I was excited to see her. Um, Somebody said, you'd never hear Brandy. She's not that belting girl, she'll give you cute runs. Well, no, I, I would say to that, because I think we talked about it on one of the In the News episodes, when she did that census um, kind of sit down acoustic concert, and she did maybe like five or six songs, like she did sitting up in my room. I, that might be the best performance I've ever seen of that song. Like that's a, go back when y'all get a chance and watch that census performance. When she does sitting up in my room, and right after that, she goes into best friend. All of that was wonderful, excellent. Like she belts when she needs to. She, I don't see her as the big, power house, you know, church auntie growl the big note and shake the room kind of singer. But Brandy has a, a great voice. I think she's comfortable kind of sitting in, she likes to sing in that, ma- they call it like mask singing where you sing to like the front of your face, which kind of goes into the runs and everything. Like there's no denying Brandy's vocal ability. I just think um in this performance, the production drowned or drowned her way out. You know what I mean? Um, Let me see. 
Yeah, the sound just seemed really low. Oh, y'all already starting. He's this person versus that person. Low. Y'all on these stand wars. Let's see. Tyler said SOS was a great album. Should have won album of the year. I just didn't think this take. I haven't, I don't even really listen to Taylor, so I can't even say what I think about her albums. Because I've the last album that came out, I got to a point where I was like, maybe it's just me and I'm being a hater. Let me give this girl a chance. And so I remember I put it on, I got through about five songs. I was like, okay, I've heard enough. I said, y'all can have that one. So, but it's like I can't even listen to her albums to kind of make a comparison because I just don't connect with her music. I don't think she sucks or anything. I just think her stuff is not for me. It's cool that she can write her songs, have a hand in her production do what she does. It just does nothing for me. And that's fine. In the same way that, you know, people don't like some of my favorite artists, it's fine. You know, everybody got somebody that's for them. She's just really not for me. She got a song. The song she might have that I thought was fun. I thought Shake It Off was a fun song. I don't even know her songs like that. What else does she have that I thought was okay? Um, hold on, give me a minute. Um, Taylor, what do you say that I would know? Hold on. I, oh, um, whatever the song is that made Kanye run on the stage, the, the You Belong to Me, Why Can't You See song. That one wasn't too bad. I thought that was a fun one. Um, Taylor, what do you sing? Yeah, I really don't listen to her. I'm sorry. So it, it, I'm, when I say I'm so far removed from her, and it's not by choice, it's just it just doesn't do anything for me. And it's not because she's white either, because some people be thinking, oh, you hating on her because she's a white woman. No, because y'all know back in the day, like with some of these other white entertainers that were women, like, I like Shania as far as the whole country pop thing. I always liked her stuff. Adele is okay with me. As a kid, Britney was cool. Christina was cool. Um, who else? Um, I always like, well, Josh Stone more so does like RB influenced music, JoJo too. But so it's not even that she's white. It's just, it don't connect with me. And it's not even that she's country because I do like country music. It just, it ain't, well, she's pop now, but yeah, I don't know. Let's see. Yep, somebody agreed and said Victoria should have had her talented behind up there. I don't know why they don't invite that woman to perform at anything. But I, I like that Victoria Monet won a few awards because, yeah, she's been at it for a good minute. And I love that. Yeah, she's, what, 34 getting it in? Good for her. I think things like that help to go against the grain of the idea that for people that want to get into music, you have to be under 25. Because she's been putting in work for years. I think we first talked about her in 2017 when she came out with the song New Love. Um, I found, I think I discovered that on Instagram or something and then found it. And I was like, okay, this girl's fun. So it's good to see that she's going from that to where she is now. All right. Um, yeah, y'all didn't like the Travis one. Okay. Somebody said Beyonce should have won album of the year last year. If I could think of, I'd have to go back and look at who the nominees were in all these years. Of the four times she was nominated, I know she was nominated for album of the year for what? I Am Sasha Fierce. I want to say the self-titled album, Lemonade and, and Renaissance. Um, I don't remember who were in the categories against her. Um, who was, which album was that one back one? Well, no, Beck, I wasn't crazy over Beck, but I understood, you know, Beck plays all his instruments and stuff. So that gives him some edge. Um, the Herbie Hancock year, I wasn't mad at because I was like, at least it's somebody black. So, yeah, maybe it was Renaissance. Maybe Renaissance should have been the winner that year because um, at least it was something different for 2022. It wasn't everybody was, you know, she went in a totally different direction, something out of the blue. Mm. Somebody said, here comes the hate, Jay-Z hurt, Jay-Z hate. It's not even Jay-Z hate. It's just kind of like, I don't know how I could explain this. It, it would be like. The best example I can use. Let's just say we decide we're all starting a movement. We're just tired of the way the United States is doing stuff, so we're going to start some new liberation movement to ensure that Black people are 100% liberated and we don't have any more of these problems and we're going against the grain and blah, 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 blah. And then we're about to have this big conference and then of all people, I invite... Who can I invite to this thing here? Um, I invite... Cory Booker, nice guy, respectable, he means well, but if it got down to the point where we need somebody to get down in the dirt, he's probably not going to do it, right? That's kind of like how I would see 
like a Jay-Z in this conversation with music. Yeah, he he fits the narrative of the conversation, but he's also so embedded into that whole system. It's hard to sometimes receive what it is he's saying. And with Cory Booker, because I think he's done some really great things, but he's also done some things I had to look at a little sideways. It, it's that same kind of conversation. Maybe he's not the best example because I don't have that much smoke for Cory, but like, yeah, he, it's, it's just like bringing somebody in who they're down, but just a little bit, not all the way. You know, it, it would almost be like what happened in 2020, right? When you had, well, one, America got real shook because everybody was in the streets, right? Everybody's protesting and everything. And then Killer Mike of all people, right? The same person who's been telling us we ain't ready for revolution and we we need to start learning how to garden and we need to start doing this. We need to start doing that. And then he's the first one telling everybody to go back in the house and, and, and keep the peace right away. And, it, and I don't think, and I don't think it was because he wanted peace. It's kind of like, no, the them, them fires and stuff are getting close to your rental properties and the businesses you own. So now it's kind of like, let me start looking out for myself. So that's what I kind of saw that as. It, it, you know, that might be a stretch, but that's just how I see it. Um, anyway. Joe Mario said, blame it on Kanye. You know, one of my friends just went viral with, that, with a tweet about that, where they were saying... How would Taylor have been received if the Kanye situation didn't happen? It's not saying that she wouldn't be famous because she was already famous. But I think the tweet was saying that when that happened, it created this over-sensationalized space where white America feels that she needs protection and she must always be protected. And so in the last few years, the narrative around her is always kind of like, you know, everybody's out to get her, kind of. So um, I could see that being a part of the conversation where, you know, there's that extra element of sympathy she's always going to get because she's also she from the outside looking in she seems like a very very nice person from what, what's there so okay this nice person gets embarrassed on a stage and so people just are already going to feel bad for her or whatever i guess i'm not really in the table so i don't really try to cook her that bad because i don't follow her enough to know her full story and i want people on here to be like oh he's just trying to bash the girl but she's having a great 2020 well she's been having a great just 10 15 years that, that girl just wins up everything Sold out stadiums, millions of records sold, drops the album every week and sells a million copies. She's having a great time. Good for her. Um, let's see. All right, we got to move on from the Grammy. So I got so many other things we got to cover. Okay, Jay-Z has 24 Grammy Awards. Okay. So what I mean, like, they have so many. Like, y'all are Grammy darlings. Like, they love y'all. But I do think some of that is strategic to personally or to – Specifically, somehow they don't get those big, big, big awards that are the, the most important ones of the night because they say what the Grammys the most important for are best new artist, record of the year, song of the year, and album of the year. And so, yeah, that kind of I think becomes a question like, dang, well, how do you win 32 and never win one of those four? Okay, it's it's a little fishy here. But then again, it goes back to it's the peers that vote. So, yeah, that was Karuchi that said that about Blue Ivy. Wow. Okay. Okay, and it's stiff person syndrome. That's what Celine had. Thank you for that. All right, let's see. We got to keep moving, y'all. Um, let's see my chat. Let's see. Thank you, little I3D. TLC's No Scrubs should have won record of the year. And if Santana didn't win Famel for album of the year, but nonetheless, it won in my household. I think back then things were a bit, were balanced a bit better as well. Back then the Grammys were really, you really didn't know what you were going to get. Like sometimes people who had the biggest year sometimes left empty handed. Like you can think back to like Mariah in what, 96, which she won nothing for um, Daydream because Alanis Morissette won all her awards. Like, you know, sometimes there's years or, or 88 where Michael and um, Prince both lost all their awards. You know, Prince lost, didn't win anything for Sign of the Times and Michael didn't win anything for Bad, like that kind of thing. So you never know what you're going to get. Um, but anyway, we're going to keep it moving. All right, let's keep scrolling through the chat. Uh, would I read Game of Thrones books for the book club? Uh, probably not. I try to really center it around like all things black people. So, you know, we do black literature, black politics, black history, black music, blackity, black, 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 everything. So I don't know if Game of Thrones is going to work for the book club. Um, oh, Lord, I forgot about this. Am I going to discuss Meg versus Nikki? Somebody remind me when I get closer to the end after I'm going through everything. Um... I didn't, I totally kind of was going to blow past that, but we can talk about it. I'm just, because I don't follow either of them either. I have my opinions, but then I, I'd be trying to make sure my opinions are, um, I know what I'm talking about before I just start talking. Right. 
but we can still talk about them. Let me get to a few of these other topics first. Um, okay, somebody said Blank Space is a great song. I know the title, but I don't know the song. Or I know the t- like, I can see the title. I think I can almost see the video, but I can't remember how the song sounds. Billy Fudd said, Calvin, just say you like singers. Taylor's out. I'm not, it's not even that, because even some of my favorite singers are not powerhouse vocalists. So I can't even use that argument. Um, oh, Joni Mitchell did perform. I, I don't think I saw Joni. I think I had already turned it off by then. Wait, Harry Styles won. That was Harry Styles. That's who won last year. He had a good year. I, I didn't listen to that album. No, I, I wouldn't know. All right, we all moving from the Grammys, y'all. Sorry, I got I got people I need to cuss out. So we'll come back. Oh wait, somebody left something. We'll come back to the um, Grammys in a sec. What up, official BNA Music eighty eight? He said, "Imagine that Black Revolution headed by Tony Dun Dun Dungy Dungy. Why don't I know that name? I need to re- get familiar. Okay. Um." Let's see. Y'all are like live in these comments. I'm never going to get to my stories here. Um, Oh, now Janelle Monae is somebody who I feel like they play. They play in her face a lot with the Grammys, especially in 2018. That pissed me off that year. Somebody said, how how do I join the book club? Um, I'll have a community tab posted with the link for the Zoom that you click. Even though I think we're about to get to a point where we graduate from Zoom and just go to StreamYard or something else. Um, but yeah, I have a link posted and then we'll go from there. All right. Okay. Let's keep going y'all. Cause I got a lot I need to cover. Um, and I feel like I skipped a whole bunch of stuff still. All right. I hate to kind of be the somber person, but we're about to change the mood here. Um, today Trayvon Martin would have been 29 and he is somebody that I'm always going to reference a lot on his channel and just in life, because I don't want his story to be one that gets forgotten. And I think for a lot of people, Trayvon was the wake up call with, the United States and how people see the world and how people see race. Cause I think for me, there were three major moments from memory that killed any hope of me ever thinking that the United States was ever going to do right by black people. The first major moment where it really started to sink in was one hur- hurricane Katrina, right? You know, imagine you're in high school or getting ready to go to your senior year of high school. And you've, you've been living in this fantasy world where they're trying to tell you that everything is post-racial and everything about race and racism and the flaws that exist within the United States is a thing of the past, right? That's how, at least I was brought up. That's how we were taught in schools. That's how black history was taught. Everything was, yeah, it started as slaves. Then it was the civil rights. Martin Luther King died. Everybody had a heart. They woke up. The dream came true and we're all happy. You know, that's, that's kind of my introduction to black history going in public schools, living in a place like Washington state, right? So then to turn your TV on and you see a bunch of black folks sitting on their roof, floating in water, being ridiculed for going into stores that have four feet of water, you know, circulating through the aisles while they're trying to grab canned goods or whatever they grab and they're being painted as villains then also being criticized because they didn't get out fast enough only because the announcement to get out came so late because people didn't really take note and take heed of what was really coming. And then, and I'm not talking about the actual residents, but I'm talking about the officials who told people not to panic or not to trip out or freak out. And then by the time they ordered the mandatory evacuation, it's almost too late. And then you think about those senior citizens from the nursing home who were in the bus that caught fire on the bridge and died before the storm even got there. Right. And then you think about, the Superdome and just all of those people just locked in there with no lights, no anything, no AC. It's the summer in the Gulf, right? 100 degree heat index. And you got to think, and I'm sure some of you might even remember even being there for that, but the idea of being in a place like the Sun Dome, right? I'm sorry, not the Sun Dome, the Superdome. Sun Dome is, I'm thinking Yakima, Washington, the Sun Dome. And Superdome. I just said Sundome again. Sun Sundome is this arena we had to perform in when I was still doing like dance, and that was in like Yakima, Washington. Superdome is New Orleans, right? Um, Superdome, no power, bathrooms, the f- piping and everything is is, is over flooded. There's feces, there's urine, there's people that have died that are in their seats because they didn't have their insulin, they didn't have their medicine, and just seeing all that and seeing no sense of urgency. People just continued with their lives. People went golfing. 
you know, officials and people in the White House and in the cabinets, they they were still having their dinners and galas and, you know, well, tell me what's going on with them. Give me a heads up. And it, it, what, it took five days before help came. And so we watched for two, three, four days, even like right wing journalist Geraldo Rivera was having a meltdown, like somebody get out here and do something. This is some bullshit, right? So to see that and then even see the way the people that are from New Orleans were treated when it came to trying to find homes for everybody, right? Because the next thing we saw was they all started being called refugees, as if, as if these aren't citizens that just didn't have a home and a place to stay yesterday, right? The idea of painting them out to be refugees, that way you can almost minimize the human nature of everything. Because in the United States, the way that our media operates, we hear refugees and we automatically just associate it with people outside of the U.S. And sadly, there's this very dismissive overtone that Americans have about whatever happens outside the world or outside the United States. So when you hear refugees, oh, well, that's just how they all live all the time anyway. So, you know, we don't have to lose sleep about what's happening in Sudan or in the Congo or in Ethiopia or where, wherever, because that's just their everyday experience. That's how a lot of people respond and react to all that. And then to watch them do that to you, the very citizens that, you know, live in this very country that everybody apparently is so proud to be a part of, right? So to watch and see that, and then just see how people started moving as these different families start getting relocated in the different cities. I always think back, because this is when I still was in Washington State, I always think back to, you know, they were going to have some families be put into housing on Joint Base lewis McCord. At the time, it was just Fort Lewis. And I mean, there was so much kickback, and people were saying, yeah, well, we need to make sure we have a fence to kind of keep them into, like, it, it was treating them as if these are people, mind you, they've lost everything, friends, family, livelihood, their way of living, all of that is gone. It's for, and for some never to come back, right? And then you're painting them to be these violent criminals who are coming to kill your children. Like, so that was wake up call number one. I didn't mean for that wake up call to be so long, but I, I just needed you to see how I saw it, right? Wake up call number two for me was Barack Obama being elected. For me, as a 20 year old at that time, I was excited. I thought it was the greatest thing ever, amazing. But in the back of my mind, I knew we were in for a sh show. I knew white people were about to show their behinds and we were going to witness it. And so we slowly watch just the, the chaos and just the overall effort to pretty much destabilize this country all in the name of making sure this man doesn't get reelected. And then he gets reelected and you see people get worse. So we, we see the emergence of the Tea Party. And these, well, this is the first time we really start to see crazy candidates. I know we always talk about how loony Trump is, but you got to think this is the era of Michelle Bachman, right? you know, create, who literally has an entire political campaign and ad when she's running for office saying, all cultures are not equal. And really what she was saying is, I'm white. How I see everything is the best. And everybody else, unfortunately, your cultures are not equal to mine. So you need to assimilate into how I see things or you're a part of the problem. You hate America. That's literally her platform, right? This is the era of the Sarah Palins. And this is the era of like, Newt, well, Newt Gingrich has been out forever, but this is when Newt Gingrich just started getting real stupid. This is when Mitch McConnell became even more powerful, right? So kind of just seeing the America that you grew up in where they, again, tried to tell you that everything was post-racial and we're all free and let's sing together in Kumbaya and clap hands and, and hold hands across America because we are the world. And you're watching just the, the, this nasty side of reality come out. And they're calling Michelle Obama all kind of monkeys and apes and uneducated. And, you know, they got the pictures of the watermelons in front of the White House and everything you can think of. So that was wake up call number two. I was like, yeah, this is some BS, right? And then for me, the, the third wake up call was when Zimmerman got off for killing Trayvon Martin. After that, I knew I was like, it, it's, it's a wrap. And I knew it was going to be that kind of verdict when I saw how they treat how they treated um, his friend, um, Gentel. I forgot her first name. Um, remember that was his friend that had the, the accent because she was from the islands and they wanted to paint her to be dumb and uneducated and they mocked her and they, they really just painted her out to be this terrible person. And then they, and then when we talk about how Trey was or Trayvon was treated and how he was perceived and how they really continue to run with this narrative, even in 2024, that he randomly attacked George Zimmerman and Zimmerman feared for his life. I'm like, Zimmerman was the person with the gun. Zimmerman was the person who was told, do not follow this kid, and he followed him anyway. Zimmerman already had a history of calling the police every five minutes for something. Zimmerman already had a, already had a history of kind of having white nationalist views, even though he's technically, he can check the white box, but white people don't see him as white, but he desires to see himself as white if it means he can climb up, right? Zimmerman already had all these issues, but again, they painted Trayvon to be the terrible person, and they tried to find everything on him. Oh, yeah, he was suspended one time because he had weed. And I'm like, and that's every white kid in every middle America high school suburb. So next in line, please. 
So those were like my wake up calls. So anyway, with that, all that being said, I just want people to pay attention to everything that's been happening because everything plays a role into something, right? Because even here we are now. So like by the time Trump got elected, I think for a lot of us, it wasn't even a shock. You were pissed off. You were annoyed. Like, damn, y'all really don't even try America. But it wasn't so far out of the loop based on things that had happened before for the United States. It's like, yeah, you didn't want to see that happen, but you could see it happening, you know, which actually leads me right into Trump. Um, so, you know, the appeals court pretty much just said you cannot keep claiming this immunity thing in regard to everything surrounding January 6th. Right. They're like, no, you just that's not going to fly. So, yeah, you can stand trial for the actions that you committed during January 6th, because that's pretty much been the very notion of his team at this moment with defense. They keep saying, yeah, well, you know, you can't charge him for whatever because the sitting president has immunity. And it's funny because the, the craziest thing is they literally just lie in our faces all the time, so blatantly and so boldly. And they do it because they know they're going to still be protected. And they do it because when we talk about a status quo and when we talk about how whiteness in the United States works, people will let the shenanigans shenanigans go down if that status quo can stay protected. And it's even crazier because, you know, right now, one of the things that Trump is promising to do, he's like, well, the crime in D.C. is so out of control. We'll, you know, we're going to federalize the police in D.C. We're going to take over D.C. and We're going to run the country. And there's going to be law and order. And I'm like, this coming from somebody with 91 counts right now. facing Who do you know that's facing 91 counts in your personal life? Probably nobody. Right. But here we are. Here's somebody facing 91 counts for it all and not for the same crime. Some is for January 6th. Some is for some random documents. Some is for all the stuff that he did in Georgia. I'm just like every five minutes you got some nonsense going on. And it's just crazy to watch the way that white America will bend to excuse all of this. But then again, they will, you know, paint black folks to be the villain and everything. They, they will pass and let Trump do whatever he wants to do. But when it comes to Trayvon Martin possibly defending himself from an armed gunman who comes up on him in the rain at night, that's where they draw the line. Unacceptable. They're not having it. I mean, we got to do something. It, it, the crime in D.C. is out, outrageous. And yes, D.C. does have an issue with crime right now. But the way that it's being painted, understand the murder per capita rate in D.C. is not the worst in the country because I can name a whole lot of white towns where it's a whole lot worse, especially in those areas where there's working class white Americans that are the majority population. But people don't ever really have want to have that you know discussion. Right. It's, it's again, paint. Chicago, D.C., St. Louis, New Orleans, Baltimore, you know, the same the same offenders every time. And again, they never highlight the fact that a lot of the crime that you're seeing is a result of punitive policy that has, you know, disproportionately affected black Americans. It's pushed people out of their neighborhoods. You've died, you know, divested from the schools and everything that's in the neighborhoods and left neighborhoods destitute and then built on top of them for an entirely different population that has no correlation or ties to that original neighborhood. And they come in and gentrify and push everybody out. And so, you know, you're, you're watching literally a takeover of so many cities and then you're pissed off because the people that were originally there technically are fighting back, technically are going against the grain of what's trying to, you know, adjust and shift in their city. So it's just like, People are on some nonsense, but it's just like they, they lie and they lie to the point where they try to lie and make it policy. Like, did you guys not see? I just watched it was Marjorie Taylor Greene. It was Matt Gates. It was a few of the other really cuckoo Republican folks who were trying to pass some kind of resolution or some kind of law to say that, you know, January 6th was not an insurrection. And anybody who says it's an insurrection hates America and blah, 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 blah. And it's like we were watching it on TV. Y'all lie so much that y'all think we just somehow forget what we saw. Right. And as somebody who lives in D.C., the craziest part, this is when people were still in the clubhouse. I remember, you know, the morning of January 6th. Everybody who lived here knew something was about to go down because the energy in this city was off. Like you had you, you just had to be here. And I think back to I got I, I should have done this as an in the news. I haven't done one in a while, but I, somebody remind me the next time I do an in the news to to post a certain video that I took. The morning of the 6th, because I just started seeing people start to organize and gather, and it just looked really weird. Somebody remind me to do that at some point. But anyway, um, Clubhouse. There was like 20 different Clubhouse rooms where people are like, Black folks, please like really be careful today, because we've been hearing all kinds of things. There's, you know, I work at the, the Renaissance Hotel over there on, I think, um, I Street, and there are so many people who have checked in today, and they keep talking about revolution and bloodshed and all that sort of stuff. Please be careful, because something is going down today. Please be careful because, you know, I'm seeing all these people who don't normally live in certain neighborhoods, you know, they're in these random neighborhoods walking around with Trump flags or whatever. And it, it looks like something weird is about to happen. On top of the fact, we already saw them promoting the day, right? Trump had already told us, everybody come that day. It's it will be wild, right? Um, Steve Bannon on his radio show, it's going to be a day. Get out here. You guys got to be here. It's going to be a time. Everyone get ready. Yeah, I'm going to kill it. Yeah. Right? All these crazy 
lunatic QAnon white folks that are mad at the world and mad at everything. Everybody's pretty much telling us it's about to be that kind of time, right? And then we watch the crap happen, right? I think we went live that night. We, we did. We went live during January 6th while it was still happening because at the time, I only lived like eight blocks from all of that. So as they were pushing all those people out as the stuff finally ended and they started pushing them over to Union Station, I'm like, that's over where I used to live. Like, I'm like, don't bring them to my neighborhood. And it was crazy because you watched all these people go and do all this stuff. And when it ended, they went to Starbucks. They went out to eat. They went to Clyde's. They went to the Smith. You know, they, they went to Ruth Chris Steakhouse and Del Frisco's and, and what else is around that side? They went to all these restaurants. You know what I mean? Just eating, having a good time. Y'all literally committed one of the worst crimes in this city. So that's why when Trump started talking about crime in D.C., I'm like, you are responsible for probably the most offensive crime to ever take place in this city. But you want to worry about whatever's happening amongst the residents. Like, Trump, shut up. Uh, but no, going back to my point, they just lie about everything. And again, that idea of protecting that status quo, they just are not going to budge on that. Because it's like the Senate, y'all had a chance to ensure that this man couldn't run for office anymore. And y'all didn't because y'all chose not to convict him during his second impeachment hearing, right? Y'all had a choice to do that. But again, it's the fear of pissing off the white collective because they want to stay in power. So they don't want to piss off white folks too much. So they're going to just let Trump do whatever he wants. And you know what's so funny? Now, y'all know I Republicans, I don't F with I don't deal with the, to me there it's a it's just chaos over there. But if they were smart, they could have, they could easily win 2024 if they had a candidate other than Trump, right? Because Joe Biden is not the strongest candidate. I understand that he has it depends on how you're looking at things. If you to some extent he has a very, very strong record, but there's also a lot of things that people have a lot of problems with. And then you add in the age. So it's kind of like if Republicans were smart, they would have already been setting up a candidate for 2024 that was not Trump. And that was not half crazy. And then they would have easily won this because honestly, the Republicans that jumped ship and voted for Biden because they were done with Trump would easily go back home and, and vote for whatever logical candidate that they would have put out there if they didn't be so pressed about Trump and being so scared of the MAGA demographic, which technically is only 30 percent of the GOP. But you know what? That's how whiteness works. So they will sit here and let the shenanigans happen. And so here we are, you know, we're again, two candidates that are 12 heartbeats away. So, you know, I have my critiques with Democrats and, and where I wish, because I've been saying this for, since day one, like I, my beef with Biden too is like, when you ran, you said you'd consider just doing one term if it got to that. And I, for me, if I was Biden, I would have bowed out gracefully after the first term and passed it to somebody else. So people can just be energized because nobody wants either of these candidates. You know, people are, are dealing with them by default because it's like, well, hell, we ain't got nobody else. But like, uh, anyway, whatever. I'm going to pause right there because I have a whole lot more I want to say on that, but it's just like the shenanigans. This country is, who? my God, Lord. All right. Let's see where we're at here. Okay, so we're going to go back some. Okay, we're talking about Katrina. And, and make sure you guys watch that documentary we talked about before, Katrina Babies. I think that gives perfect insight to just the experience of the people who lived that. And I just think back to being at Howard because, you know, a lot of HBCUs took in a lot of the students from Xavier because Xavier had so much damage at the time, right? And so, like, when I got to Howard, a lot of classmates were people who were sitting on their roof when, or sitting on their ceiling, right? Because um, I came into Howard the year after. So that next school year, now the people that are in your class are – some of these are people who – had to sit on their ceiling and then they, their family got moved to Houston or they had to sit on their roof and, you know, they stayed in New Orleans, but it's, it doesn't feel like home at the moment. Because at that time, new, that whole segment, that whole war was still just all rubble in, in 2006. Like it took years for them to rebuild a lot of that stuff. And some of that stuff didn't get rebuilt. It got repurposed and gentrified. Some neighborhoods never came back, you know? Um, let's see. Yes, lack of humanity is staggering, Abby Wise. I agree. That's in relation to Katrina again. Um, Piscean Beauty. Let's bring it back full circle. Remember Celine? Even Celine Dion knew what was up. Thank you for bringing that up. Celine Dion was pissed off. She went off. I remember that. That's why I was like, okay, I rock with her. In addition to her just being a great singer, Celine was not having it. Celine was on there dragging everybody. I can't remember what she said, but I remember her talking to... I specifically remember her being pissed off about the fact that people were more focused on 
folks going into the stores and taking items than actually rescuing the people that were dying. Everybody, all like if you go back, if you can think back and remember what you saw on the TV, you almost saw more images of people pull, pulling items through the water in shopping carts than you did people on the roof asking for help, right? Because they wanted to keep talking about that and talking about that and talking about that and start reporting on the crimes and reporting on, you know, how many people were sexually assaulted in the Superdome and so on. Like that's what they solely want to focus on. And the people were still waiting for help. And mind you, that's just New Orleans. We're not even talking. The whole Gulf was hit hard. You got people in Mississippi who really were hurt or hit bad. Alabama as well. Other parts of Louisiana. It's just New Orleans was kind of like the, the, the epicenter of the story because it's this major metropolitan city that's been hit. Right. And you're seeing things that you've never seen before in the United States with, with a demographic that, of course, you don't want to see things happen to. But it becomes a, a well, we'd almost expect this based on how the country operates. Yeah, it would be this community that gets hit the way it gets hit and not have any element of, of agency or remorse to, or, or urgency to go and make sure that this community is OK. Yeah, that, that hurt to watch. Um. Don Smart said she went to President Obama's inauguration. I didn't go to the first one because it was so cold. And I this was, I was still at Howard and I was um I had the the desk shift because I was a yeah, resident assistant. Um so I just watched it on the TV. I went in 2012 and it was so cold. I was like, man, we almost went back. It was freezing. It's weird because it's the winters are not as cold as they used to be. But that day, I just remember because um, you know, the metro, the subways. When it's something like the inauguration and everything, you just can't take the subway to like where the, the National Mall is. No, the subways, all that's shut down. The subways will drop you off a lot further out or wherever, and then you got to walk for security reasons. So I remember we walked and walked and walked, and it was so cold. And I, I remember we went to a, a hotel really quick because they had the big lobby and it was on the TV. And I was like, we can, if y'all want, we can just stay in here. Because I was like, I was good. At that point, he was already president anyway. I, I, we don't got to be out here. But we somehow made it to... Um, <laughs> to the National Mall, and it, God, it was so cold. I, that was the first and last inauguration I'm ever going to. Um. Anyway, let's see. And, and that was really when I was really into the symbolism and, and was so happy to see such a great story. And my politics was, I was still adjusting to my politics and adjusting and learning and stuff. So, you know, I was really excited at the time. It was a great time. Um. Because that's when I really, um, that's when I still saw the good in everything and was very optimistic about everything. And, oh, it's fine. Things are going to work out in the end. It's okay. You know, don't worry. America will always bounce back and do right. But <laughs> look, that Trayvon Martin Vernon came out, you know, and after everybody and everything. You know what? Look, and another thing. <laughs> like, that went right out the window. All right. Mm hmm. Um, Star Tasha Dillard said, black people go to jail for a whole lot less. Well, yeah, let's get to Brett Favre in a second, too. I'm going to get to him, too. Mm -hmm. Sad how we can't afford housing or even apartments anymore, a problem across America. I was just talking to my mom about that today. I was like, mama, I don't think I'm ever going to buy a house. I mean, unless I get married and now we got dual income. But like, I was like, as, as like me, myself, and I, I'm probably never getting a house in D.C. Because um, you can't get a house in D.C. for under like 550000 at this point. And if you can find one for that price, it's probably a house that doesn't have running water. <laughs> like, uh, to just get a decent home right now, you're at least paying 600 k at least. And that's not even like a house with a yard and, and space. That's going to be one of those like kind of row house setups where, you know, you get a patch of grass and that's your backyard. You don't have a permanent driveway or anything. So you got to do street parking and then you still got to move your car across the street on Tuesdays for street sweeping or they will tow it and ticket it like I mean, unless you move out to Maryland, Virginia, but then it's a different tax code. It's just a whole lot of nonsense. So, sheesh. All right. Gonna keep going. Yeah, y'all said y'all remember that night because we, we had a good time on that live because we it was like watching it in real time and responding to it because January 6th was crazy because I just knew, like, I, I just, after I saw, remember, remember, um, Olympus is falling with Jamie Foxx. That's the movie where like the, the, the whatever country comes and attacks the U.S. And so when they start attacking the White House and everything, there was all kind of guns and gadgets that were coming out of the ceiling and everybody was, I just knew we were about to just see something that they would probably never air on TV again. Because <laughs> I was like, oh, it's going down. Once they breached that Capitol and the barricades and they got inside, I, I was just waiting for the Secret Service and the people to just come straight down the roof on the ropes, like ready. And there was none of that. I'm watching the officers running and getting beat up. And I'm like, what is going on? What? What? Wait a 
minute. I was like, Beyonce got better security than that. Like, what y'all doing? <laughs> like, Lord. And then finding out that a lot of those Capitol Police were ordered to stand down before the thing even started. They were already ordered to not have combat with these people. So a lot of that, we all start remembering how that all went. We're going to move on, though, because I'm running out of time. Um, and it's been an hour, and I ain't even got through everything. But getting back to um, my point, it's just like you just – the lack of accountability and the lack of just holding certain people accountable. And this is why I don't like Merrick Garland. Like at one point I used to be pissed that – you know, remember he was supposed to be a Supreme Court justice, and then McConnell was like, oh, we won't have an election this close. Oh, we won't have uh, a Supreme Court you know, appointed, appointed this close to an election. We just can't do it. We can't. And so they kind of like stole that spot from him and he never got it but then he ended up becoming you know like what is he ag or whatever attorney general and my thing is he merrick garland moves so slow and everything so slow like the, the, the everything that cuckoo man has done should have already been handled that's all i'm saying i know if i were president and i led an insurrection i probably wouldn't be alive anymore they would have killed me that day on national tv they would snipe me so fast right this man sat here and did all this stuff and, and nothing right if I had been president and I had all these random documents in my apartment under my couch, you know, the way they would have been dragging me out of here in cuffs and everything, I probably would have died in the back of the van. They would have, oh, yeah, we, he wasn't wearing a seatbelt and we hit the brakes. He broke his neck on the window. They would have found some kind of way, right? You know, if I had been president and I was caught on the phone trying to rig some votes, like all I need is 11,732 votes to so or however many votes he needed. So I need you to go find them for me. You know, the, the way they would have taken me out and killed my puppy, and I don't even have a dog, but they would have found one and said it was mine and stepped on his head. So to just sit and see how things move is just funny, which brings me to my next point, The Breakfast Club. I really don't like that The Breakfast Club has become a hub for American politics. And I say that because, to me, The Breakfast Club is for entertainment. So if you're going to have all of these people who are running for these positions be on there, then I need you to actually have a conversation about politics. I don't want to hear about who their favorite artist is and what's in their purse. Is it hot sauce and all the other stuff? It's just like, and they've had so many people on there. And my beef is they don't challenge people when they come on there with their nonsense. They had Vivek Ramaswamy, whatever his name is, on there a few weeks back. I'm like, why is he on there? You let this man come on here. And he's going to go and spew all of these random conspiracy theories and all this crazy stuff that kind of fits that narrative of all that QAnon crap. And you, you barely challenge him on it. And then the thing with Vivek is Vivek moves and speaks as if he is the smartest person in the room and the rest of us are stupid. And so they let him get away with all of these cuckoo crazy answers and barely challenge him on it. And I'm like, are, are you serious? And then, you know, same thing when they had Kennedy on there. And Kennedy comes out there with all these conspiracies and all these crazy things going on. And they just let him slide and say any. And everything. And I know people keep trying to say, well, you have to give everybody an opportunity to show their stance. I hear that. But understand, I need black people to understand our politics is not everybody else's. When y'all try to do this whole both sides thing or give everybody a chance, hear them out, hear them out. One, we're already operating in a space where all of the parties still operate under a system of white supremacy and operate under a system of anti-blackness. So we already don't really have leverage with anybody to begin with. So don't think that just because we all, it's still one person, one vote, we all have the same vote. Please don't think that out of nowhere, you know, we get to move in the same manner as everybody else. Other people can move in the manner that they move politically because a lot of times they won't be hurt by who's in office. White people can vote and do whatever they want to do and they're going to be all right no matter who's in office. This is why white American politics, it, it bounces back and forth, right? On Mondays, everybody loves Joe Biden. On Tuesdays, everybody hates him. On Wednesdays, President Trump should be president again, and then Thursdays, everybody hates him some more. And then on Friday, you know, then it's like there's no there's no precedent set in whiteness. Whiteness goes wherever it goes as long as the status quo holds on, right? For black people, we're collateral to the decisions of white people when it comes to voting, which is why I think black people sadly vote in the way that we vote because we have to consider how everybody else is going to move before we put in our vote because we recognize we're only 13% of the population and we're not even 13% of the electorate. So we know that there's a certain way we have to move, right? So even when those dream candidates come in, a lot of us get scared and, and back out because it's like, damn, man, I would get behind this person. But I know if I vote for this person, I'm going to waste my time because there's only going to be so many people that get behind this. White America's not moving on this. So, damn, man, let me go and get to this person who's safe enough for the white people to get behind. Like, that's voting for black folks. That freaking sucks. So when a place like The Breakfast Club has a Nikki Haley on there and then you challenge her and, and say, OK, you've said some things that are very questionable in, you know, with regard to, you know, race and blah, 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 blah. 
And then you let her sit there and say, well, we didn't have a problem with racism in this country till Obama came in. He was very divisive. And I'm like, first of all, Obama was so scared to talk about race because he was trying so hard to not piss off white people. Like, to me, Obama, yes, the symbolism, like I said, great, wonderful. We loved it. You loved seeing Michelle and the kids. And, and the, the, I, I'm not going to lie. I, I got a kick out seeing that. I loved seeing them in whatever they're doing. Yes, black couple running the show. Loved it. But then politics and the policies, policy is a different conversation. And then to that point, when it came to race, because Barack Obama really tried to run with the post-racial, we're all American, we're in this together, and it kind of negated what I just said about how black and white politics is very different and we're not playing the same game. He tried to play the game the way he thought they wanted him to play it and tried to be a candidate that could please everybody. I'll give him the kudos to trying to just be a universal president, but America is not a universal place. America is whiteness. America is Whitey McWhiterson and white-tastic. And anything that goes against whiteness is a problem. And so Barack Obama purposely stayed away from race because he didn't want to be seen as that guy. And think back to when you had Henry Louis Gates have that situation where he's in his neighborhood and the officer didn't think he lived there and he got arrested. And what did Barack Obama do? He said, I'm going to step in and we're going to have a conversation over some beers. Like, you know, it, it seems ideal. It seems like a great idea. Yeah, let them talk it out. And we can really just show how Americans we can come together. And what happened? That officer wasn't budging. He said, I'm not wrong about nothing. Everything I said was right. He was wrong. He was aggressive. He didn't comply. And I'm not budging. And that's all it is to it. And then what ended up happening is that white officer became a hero. They, it made Barack Obama look half crazy and look soft. And then everybody's cussing out Henry Louis Gates at the same time. And then the only other time you saw Barack Obama ever really say anything in relation to race, who was it? Trayvon Martin. If I ever had a son, he'd most likely look like Trayvon. And that's all he said. And that for white America was too much. They, he's race baiting. This is so divisive. Like they freaking lost their shit, right? And it's like, and then for black folks, we're like, yeah, we think, thank you for saying that, but what's next? Like, what you about to do now, right? And it's like, we're going to let the courts handle it. Oh, okay, all, right. all right, fine, 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 fine. Like, you know what I mean? And so it's just like when I think of like the Breakfast Club and you're bringing on all these people, but then the people that are doing the interviews have no background in politics, have no background in policy, have no background in, in, in anything, barely humanities, right? Barely in civics. Their, their bailiwick is entertainment, hip hop, pop culture. I don't want my candidates on here trying to trend and, 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 and be a hashtag. I need them to tell me what the policy is going to be and how does this work and how this doesn't work. So at this point, why are you having people on there? Like, there's no reason for Vivid to be there because he's not running anymore. So what's he on there for? He went on after he backed out. So you let him go on there and say all that crazy cuckoo Trump stuff and conspiracy theory this and conspiracy theory that. The same person who said, who, who tried to tell Don Lemon what is offensive to black folks, right? And tried to say the whole conversation about referencing slavery is all about victimhood. Really? Right. So these are people y'all keep platforming. And I get it. Folks keep trying to say, well, you got to give everybody their, their space and blah, 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 blah. No, you don't. On this, Listen, this channel, I pick and choose what I'm going to talk about. I pick and choose what I give energy and light to. Sometimes there are topics and conversations that you guys are like, oh, it's kind of going to talk about that. I'm like, hell no, we're not giving no energy to that. Not today. Not on this channel. You know, there's just certain things we're not jumping into. Right. Um, so I just think that's nonsense. If you're going to keep marketing yourself as an outlet, to be the voice of black America, but then you keep putting on people that do things that are detrimental to our experience. And it's, and my thing too, in the same way you can give the smoke to Kamala and Joe, which was rightfully so, yeah, Joe, I'm sorry, don't tell me I'm not black if I choose not to vote for you. That's probably the worst approach you wanna have because now y'all getting too comfortable with the black vote, right? I think it's warranted when you do challenge candidates, but it's almost like y'all, you're almost moving as if you're trying to get Cuckoo Man back in office. I see you give Kamala and Joe a whole lot more smoke than the other crazies, right? The other crazies get to go in there and say all the crazy stuff they want to, and it's all cool. It's all water under the bridge. Either everybody's catching it or nobody's catching it. I need some consistency. That's all I'm going to say on that. So, yeah, I just I, I just do not like them specifically being the folks to talk about politics because I would rather have these people go on platforms where we can actually talk about the actual policy they're trying to push. What laws are in place? What does this law do? How does this law work? A lot of times you would think that the goal would be to challenge the disinformation and misinformation that is out there. But instead, sometimes a platform like The Breakfast Club actually stirs it up even more, right? A platform like The Breakfast Club, because everything is kind of centered in, again, shock value and ratings, they let a lot of stuff slide. 
it goes back to what I said when they had old boy on there that 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 bought whatever the medicine was for people that had HIV, and then he skyrocketed the price to everything, and then they had him on the show, and they barely challenged him on it, and then when they asked him about, you know, why would you take a medication that is literally keeping people alive, and then skyrocketed the price by I forgot how much percent, but it was over a thousand. And then he gave some BS answer, like, you know, so capitalism works, you do what you do in your business. And then they were like, you yeah, know, I understand. I can respect it. What the? F no, you can't. Like, oh, get these people out of here. I'm sorry. Yeah, I just need to understand politics. This is our life. This is our livelihood, unfortunately. So the idea of treating this like some entertainment podcast, I'm just not down with. Right. You know, it's just we're in a space where there's a whole lot of shenanigans. Right. And there's a lot of idiots being given mics. Right. And so folks flock to chaos. And so you got all these folks who are now experts in fields they know nothing about and are influencing and encouraging people to do all kinds of stupid things, right? Even with, with the pandemic, you had folks, especially when we really didn't know what was going on with COVID, and you had folks telling folks, don't wear a mask. That's just that's the just random stupid things, right? Just going against science at this point. People all of a sudden became experts and knew more than certain things, like knew more than scientists and just certain things that were common sense. The vaccine is a conversation. Masks are a conversation. Like there's so many conversations that could be had, but you have people come out of the woodworks who have no expertise in anything re in relation to healthcare, science, anything, but they got all the answers because, you know, they start making videos and got some loud background music and, and got a few graphics and a meme they posted and now they're the experts. So yeah, let's all go take ivermectin, right? Let's go take a, a freaking item that is used in aquariums to fight COVID, right? We got rappers saying, all you got to do is drink some hot tea. It's the hot liquid that's going to kill the COVID. And people running behind that. Which is why I'm also looking at Saturday Night Live sideways, because I know they had Nikki on there this past week, and Nikki Haley, not Minaj. And then again, again, making light of, again, her approach to race and slavery and the Civil War and whatever else. And again, now we got sound bites. Here we go. Sound bite. I call it sound bite forgiveness. People go and become powerful, get into office, run for office, do terrible things, suck at what they do, uninformed. And then when it's all said and done, they get to be on Dancing with the Stars like Sean Spicer. You know, they just play in our faces. We literally watch an inauguration that was only attended by maybe 300,000 people. And then you watch Sean Spicer go up there and tell us, you know, the Trump inauguration was the most attended inauguration, period. And I'm like, more people went to the Diana Ross Central Park concert. Like, relax, right? Or Jimmy Fallon when Cuckoo Man was still in the running. And Jimmy Fallon's like, ooh, can I mess up your hair? And I'm like, y'all realize by humanizing and kind of making light of the people that are in these spaces that most likely will be making decisions that affect us for the next 20 years. Because a lot of y'all are pissed off about your tax returns. Because like I've been saying since 2017, when the tax code changed, that up until 2024, your taxes were going were gonna to get higher and higher and higher until 2024. This is the last year of the Trump tax cut for the rich. And yeah, like, so understand policy affects us in the long term, but it's like, y'all let everything just kind of slide. My thing is like, I understand the idea of hanging with politicians and laughing, but that, that's for after they've done things right. That's for after people got the policy they wanted and everybody's doing good and everybody's in a great space. Then yeah, we can laugh. We can talk about the greatness, but no, every politician and president we didn't have and effed up so much stuff, every last one of them. Because even when things are well here, we blowing up something across the water, Right. Anyway, I was supposed to stop talking, and I went right back in my pocket. Let me go back to the comments. And another thing. like, Okay, let's see. Boom, boom, boom. Somebody said that poor puppy. Yeah, like they're going to take my puppy out of there, and I ain't even got one. Let's see. Nerd Lars said the median down payment for a house in DC in 2023 was 60K. And it's crazy because, you know, DC has this really great program for like first time home buyers where they will help you with up to $200,000 off your first home, depending on what it is that you make. But the, the crazy part is $200,000 off of an $800,000 house is still, it's great, but it's like the house is still $800,000. And then it's only like 1,800 square feet, you know, a two bedroom, one bath type of thing. That's what's crazy. Um, Oh, okay. Darling Nikki said that's White House Down with Jamie Foxx. Okay, yeah, you're right. White House Down was Jamie Foxx, and then Olympus Has Fallen is the other one. I don't, I can't think of the guy's name. Is it? But Angela Bassett is in that one. Okay, I remember that. All right. Somebody said, "I really wish people would stop going to that ignorant show." My. I, <sighs> 
it's kind of like, I don't mind when the rappers go on there and talk about their album and their tour and they laugh about, you know, yeah, back in 1996, yeah, I tried to get on a demo with, with, with I don't know, somebody from Wu-Tang, but then he didn't show up for the studio session. And then I found out he missed the studio session because he fell asleep at the house, stuff like that. Cool. But then when you got people on there like that can technically play a role into how the rest of our lives will be affected, that's where I start having a problem. Because otherwise, if you're going to have that, bring on additional people who are the experts in those fields to have those conversations. Because it's missed opportunity. That's really what it is. If you're going to have these people on here, then make sure you got people who can have the conversations. That's why I used to really go hard about the revolt black summit where i was like y'all keep having this summit about the state of black america but then the whole panel are celebrities and candace owens like what and it's like oh we put candace owens on there because we need a, an opposing viewpoint no candace owens her goal is to make money by being a mouthpiece for white supremacy if you want to have a conversation of bringing a black conservative on there to maybe give a conservative point of view then maybe why don't you get somebody who's not trying to get down on the knees for everything white right there are Black conservatives who still have a space where they want great things for Black Americans. I most likely don't agree with the majority of their opinions, but there are some that are in that space as opposed to just bringing in just loonies and crazies who spend their entire time downgrading everything that is Black and making us out to be uninformed and talking down to us like we're all stupid and then trying to gaslight us like it's all in our mind. Like, be for real. So, like, Revolt TV kept having these, these black summits, and it was pissing me off because it's like you keep having these celebrities on here, and they don't know what they're talking about. And I'll always remember, I think they had one where they talked about the state of black America, this, that, and the third. And then T.I. starts going off of his, his on his rant about how black America's thriving, and the only examples he could give of how, of how we were thriving was just naming all the celebrities he knew and what they had. And I'm like, that's not... Okay. Y'all got it. It's y'all world, and we just living in it. I ain't got the Tyrese yet, but I'm going to drag him a little bit later, too. Everybody catching it tonight. So um, let's see. Didn't that guy with Charlemagne try to convince us that Taylor Swift is up there with Michael Jackson? I, I don't even know what that's about, but that sounds like some nonsense that would happen there. I'm going to need y'all to stop trying to make everybody the next Michael Jackson. Let, let artists exist as themselves. They, they, y'all do that with Beyonce, too. Like I said it before. In music, the problem that exists is... We measure all of these artists in a parallel, right, where they measure up against each other accomplishment by accomplishment. Instead of looking at music as a spectrum and people sit in different spaces within the spectrum and some artists have some things that another doesn't and vice versa. And sometimes there's things that they, they do have together or have in common and there's some things that cross and there's some things that are different. Music should be looked at that way. When you constantly try to parallel or measure somebody to measure up to somebody else, they can never exist in their own artistry. So when you constantly do the argument, well, Beyonce's Michael Jackson of this era you automatically chip away from the greatness that is Beyonce because now you're measuring her up to somebody else that is from another era. And automatically, you can't just appreciate her as who she is because you got somebody else in, in, in the center of the conversation. Same thing with the idea with the Taylor or whatever. Like, y'all setting Taylor up, first of all. But, you know, it, it's that. And I, somebody just posted a great example because when we talk about impact, a lot of it also plays a role with just PR and how media moves, right? Because you know somebody who's never in this conversation of just greatness and greatness and greatness? Garth Brooks. This is a man that has like nine diamond albums. And we never hear about them. We never hear about him, right? It just kind of shows how PR moves and how we can kind of paint the narratives of some people and some others. So you have this era we're in now where there's artists who have great success and have done certain things. And sometimes the, the standards and the accolades they have don't even measure up to somebody else's, but they've been marketed to be the replacement for somebody else. I don't think these artists want to be seen as the next anybody. I don't think Beyonce wants to be seen as this generation's Michael Jackson. I think she wants to be seen as Beyonce. I think, you know, The Weeknd wants to be seen as The Weeknd. Usher wants to be seen as Usher. You know, all these different artists want to be seen as who they are. I think we can give the accolades to the artists that inspire them and say, yeah, Michael Jackson or Prince or Whitney or Janet or whoever these people are helped pave the way in the same way that the people before them, so the Temptations and the James Brown and the Sam, Sam Cooks and, and, and the Dinah Washingtons and all of them helped to pave a role and the Tinas paved the role for them and so on and so forth. The role keeps getting paved. And as the role gets paved, more people can ride and drive on it. And then they take it to that next lane and they pave some more. So Beyonce is going to pave a, a role for people that come out in 20 and 30 years. And they're going to be like, yeah, when I was coming up, it was Beyonce that was like, Everybody gets their shine. So that idea of always trying to 
make people become something else and try to chip away at everybody else's legacy to uplift somebody else. I, I can't get behind that. I can't stand it. Anyway. Um, Um, Stacy Lord said, hey, Calvin, I remember when Vivek was on The Breakfast Club and the commentator was asking him stupid questions about if he ran for class president in elementary school. Yeah, see, uh, like, I just can't do it. I can't. Um, a pimp said, Obama was the example of black excellence at the time, to be honest, the good, the indifferent, and the bad. And I think that's a very fair assessment of that. Like, I think at the time that he was elected, because I think, I don't think people remember how crazy it was under Bush. Because Bush was not such a just evil, spirited, open out front kind of person, and his policy was absolutely terrible, but at least he kind of presented himself to be somewhat likable, right? People let a lot of his shenanigans slide, right? People let a lot of things kind of get brushed under the rug by the time we got to Cuckoo Man, because Orange Man was just such an anomaly of like everybody before him just looked like freaking, you know, one of the 12 disciples or something. But the Bush era was chaos. It was a sh show. So by the time Obama got in there for a lot of people, it was like, finally, it's the end of all that craziness. We can finally get a fresh start. There's a chance for things to, to get better. But then that great element of racism jumped right in and, and derailed all of that. And so really, his, to me, his presidency is defined by the first two years before the 2010 midterm. Because everything after the 2010 midterm, he it was just a fight. He couldn't get a lot of stuff done after that. No longer had the House and the Senate. And then each midterm and election after that, just chaos, right? Um, Let's see. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, I want to keep going because we're getting really, I'm so far behind in this slide. I'm only on page four and I think I got 10 pages tonight. Um, yeah. When I said ivermectin was used successfully in Africa to treat COVID. Here's a conversation with the ivermectin. At the time that the name was being tossed around, the actual specific kind of treatment wasn't even available to the public. And a lot of people went and went to the pet stores because they saw some stupid forums and QAnon stuff saying, well, you can get it out of this specific kind of item that you use to clean the aquariums. And you literally had people die taking, you know, chemicals that you use in the aquarium tank, you know, thinking that it's the same, you know, medical treatment, this medical treatment, that because, yeah, they were running trials with ivermectin at the time because this is when we didn't even have, you know, Paxlovid wasn't a thing yet. They were still trying to figure out the vaccine. So there wasn't any, nobody knew what to do yet, right? Everybody's doing tests and trials. And the problem was things that were still in trial were, were being seen as the, the cure, right? And so that's the that's the danger of that, right? And the danger of people like Dr. Oz and and who's the other guy? Um, Dr. Drew, who went out and who, who at, at one point had very respectable images where people really trusted them with their livelihood. And then watching the two of them go out there and say a lot of things that were not true a lot of things that were detrimental that I'm sure led to people making very foolish decisions when it came to their health, like chaos. All right, we got to keep it moving. And yeah, people would drink. Thank you, um, Zena. Folks were drinking bleach because guess who? Orange Man told you to just drink a little bit of bleach and just rub it on you. Get, get it all, that's going to kill all the germs. Just drink some bleach. And people were doing it because, again, when it comes to like politics, now I always say do not be a fan of a politician. They are here to work for you. You hold the fire to their feet. But there are some people, because again, symbolism and the love story and everything, some people really almost worship some of these candidates and, and get behind them. And they will they worship the ground these people walk on. I, I don't think y'all get it, especially when it comes to Trump. There are people willing to kill for this man. Seriously, like, why do you think you keep hearing these stupid conversations from white folks talking about civil war? There's going to be civil war. And I'm like, who, who are y'all fighting? Because the rest of us are going to work. Like, so where, where is this war going to take place at? Where y'all going where y'all going to be at so I know to just stay home that day? Let me know when y'all finish playing around. Hopefully y'all all cancel each other out so the rest of us can enjoy our lives. But, like, be for real. Um, okay, let's keep it moving, y'all. This is stupid. Okay, I'm going to be semi-quick on this one. This is about the parent of the boy that went and shot up all them kids in the school, Crumbly, Jennifer Crumbly. 
she was found guilty of manslaughter. So let me jump to that really quick. Um, remember, this is the parent that kind of had a hint that her son was probably going to go and shoot up the school. And she did nothing about it. Jennifer Crumbly, mother of Ethan Crumbly, found guilty of involuntary manslaughter and son school shooting. The Michigan mother was convicted on four counts of manslaughter in connection with her son's deadly rampage at Oxford High School in 2021. Um, let me see. She, the unanimous verdict came on the second day of jury deliberations in a landmark trial in which Crumbly became the first parent to be held criminally responsible for a mass shooting committed by their child. Crumbly, 45, was convicted on all four counts. Um that she faced. Her son, Ethan, now 17. That's crazy. He's only 17. And, and he wasn't even 17 when he, he was like 15 when he did it or 14. Um, pleaded guilty as an adult to murder, terrorism, and other crimes and was sentenced in December to life in prison without parole. Now she faces up to 15 years in prison per count. All right. So that's 60 years um, and remains held on bond. She will be sentenced on April 9th. It was very difficult. A member of the jury said after the verdict, Lives hang in the balance, and we took that very seriously. I don't see what's difficult about this. She knew what was happening. Guilty. We ain't about to play these games. But again, again, whiteness works a certain way. Where they will sometimes try to stretch and see how far they can go. It goes back to, again, the Zimmerman verdict. When you saw the interviews with the jury, what did that white woman say? I knew his heart was in the right place. I just knew his heart was in the right place. I was like, what, to kill a kid? Okay. I can probably guess what kind of politics you get behind. The jury said the decision hinged in large part on who was the last adult to handle the weapon. The thing that really hammered it home was that she was the last adult with the gun, the juror said. Craig Schilling, the father of Justin Schilling, 17 years old, one of the four victims in the school shooting, teared up when the verdict was announced. He later hugged the Oakland County prosecutor, Karen McDonald, and members of her team and shook their hands with law enforcement. Um, we have been asking for accountability across the board, and this is one step towards that, Schilling said, outside of the classroom. I feel that moving forward is not going to be any easier because of what we left behind, but it gives us hope for the future. The trial, which opened on January 25th in an Oakland County courtroom, hit at themes of good parenting and gun safety, and it has been uh, it has come at a consequential moment in the U.S. where the drumbeat of school shootings have rolled communities or royal communities like Uvalde, Texas, Nashville, Tennessee, and Perry, Iowa, in an effort to determine to what extent a parent should be held accountable for the actions of their child, jurors in Oakland County examined more than 400 pieces of evidence, including text messages and photos from Crumley's cell phone and dramatic video of the shootings of the shooting spree, which left many in the courtroom visibly shaken. The prosecution called more than 20 witnesses, including law enforcement officials and school staff members, while the defense brought in just one, the defendant. To prove the case, the prosecution tried to portray Crumbly as the neglectful mother who cared more about her hobbies and carrying on extramarital affairs than about spending time with her son. Then she did, um, then, I'm sorry, then when she and her husband gave their son a semi-automatic handgun as a gift in the days before the shooting, prosecutors said neither of them properly stored it. On the day of the shooting, after the Crumblies had been summoned to the school because of a disturbing drawing of a gun made by their son, the parents didn't tell the school officials he had access to a weapon or take him home. Ethan Crumbly would go on to kill four students. Um, and you know how the rest happens with this article starts getting along. So what I was going to say, the crazy part, again, especially when we talk about the school shootings, it is so normalized that we've become desensitized to them. If you think back at Columbine, when Columbine happened in 99, and that wasn't the first school shooting, but it, they just didn't happen as frequently then, right? After the 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 ban on sem semi-automatic weapons ended in 2004. We started to see the increase in mass shootings again. But Columbine at one point was referenced like the Bible when it came to conversations around gun violence. It was always the reference. At this point, Columbine is like Sesame Street because there's been so many other rampages and shootings that are just so much more worse, which is a horrible thing to say, but that's the reality of what is. And so the fact that we have parents who take pride in, let's get our 14, 15 year old, a semi-automatic weapon. Why? Now, I'm not anti-gun, but I do think you as a parent and as an adult need to have some discernment about what's a good idea and what's not. The school calls you and says, hey, your son just has this very disturbing drawing that shows guns and dead people and everything else. Is he okay? You know you just bought him that crazy weapon, right? Military style weapon you pretty much bought him. And you don't even say, even if you didn't say y'all had a weapon, you didn't even think to, you know, maybe take him home. Maybe check his bag. Make sure he doesn't have anything. Maybe take away the weapon and say, yeah, maybe we did this too early. Because, listen, my parents bought me a BB gun when I was 14. And, you know, I could shoot the cans off the fence. You know, and I had a nice little BB gun that had a CO2 pouch. And you could pump, pump, pump. And the, the BB would come out a little bit um, with a bit more force when you use enough CO2. Like, that was the kind of weapon I had. But even having that little BB gun, 
it wasn't allowed to leave the house. And the only time I could use it was if my dad was downstairs and I was in the backyard and he could see me from the thing. And the only thing I could do is shoot cans off the fence. He better not catch me trying to shoot at any crows that are flying above, but I'm like a tree hugger and an animal lover. So I wasn't going to be trying to kill anything. You know, I couldn't start trying to, my friend Chris that lived down the street had a BB gun as well. I couldn't just, we couldn't just have a shoot off with the BB guns, even though um, one time me and him were being foolish and playing around with his BB gun. We were both popping each other, <laughs> stupid kids. But yeah, my parents were like, well, we're not having that. And like, it was to the point where like, I couldn't go and buy my own BBs. They had a count of what was there. Like, it, it was a serious game. And even though it was just a BB gun, it was like, yeah, we're not playing like that because stuff happens. So to know your child is not well, and you and, and if you can go back and look at those text messages that she had with the son, they're almost joking about like what he's thinking about doing. And four people die. That doesn't even include the people that are injured, right? And they just move around like, well, things happen. That's that's where we're at right now. That's the United States. That's that is what is normal. The craziest thing, I told you at the time I was at the baseball game and they thought there was a mass shooting. Everybody was running around and freaking out. The craziest part is when I watched the news that night, they interviewed this girl that was also at the game. And she was like, well, you know, they had a shooting at my school before, so I'm just used to this. So it wasn't even as scary as the first time. I'm like, this is crazy. We are living in some wild times. All right, let me read a few comments and then we're going to shift. I'm going to bring the energy up a tiny bit and then bring it right back down because I got some more people to drag. And then I promise you we're going to end on a happy note. I just got to get all this out while I'm in my pocket. I don't have a lot of free nights because we've been working on so many projects outside of YouTube that we're trying to get done and they take up so much time and energy. I've honestly been in meetings every day and every night since December 18th, aside from three days, every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, there's some kind of meeting I'm on at night. Like, man, but I'm excited for what's to come. The work will definitely pay off. But that's my life right now. So I just got to play catch up with some of these topics. Okay. Um, where are we at here? Somebody said, oh, heck no. I remember both Bush fools, Desert Storm and Desert Shield. I uh, had my black behind sitting in the sand burning up. Oh, yeah. I had to go out in the Middle East in the heat with that. Them bushes were, I to me, the darkest years in American policy, Reagan, Bush one, Reagan and that, that combination of Reagan and Bush number one, whew, we're still suffering from that, right? Like, Lord, crazy. Um, Let's see. Somebody said, as a biology major, the pandemic showed me how easily people can be misinformed. So sad. And I think that's the danger of what happens when politics becomes so intertwined with people's almost religious beliefs or how they approach religion, how they approach different things. And then that idea, again, of being a fan of politicians and hating other ones so much that you start latching on to elements of craziness and the idea of wanting to remain in power and stuff. And before you know it, people, common sense is... Things that are collectively understood are no longer collectively understood. I think we live in a space now where things that were once collect collectively understood are up for grabs, up in the air. Nothing is certain anymore. Precedent is no longer set. And that's why we've really been living in an anything goes kind of space right now. Yeah, just drink some bleach, guys. Iron Will said, I doubt she does 60 years. I don't think she's going to do 60 years. She, they'll probably get, I don't know what she's going to get, honestly. But when I think of other people who've been convicted of certain things and how light some of their crime or their punishments have been, who knows? Um, I'm going to guess between... ...10 to 13 years is my guess. I could be wrong. Who knows? Maybe she'll face 60, but I don't see them giving her a whole bunch of um, years on that. I, I, I can see it, but we'll see. Um, Python Beauty said, I don't understand gun culture. Why does your minor need a handgun? I, I'm in a space. So much stuff just doesn't make sense. Like, I don't even like trophy hunting. I get pissed off every time I see it. That's when people go over to the continent of Africa or go to Asia or parts of South America and they go and shoot all those, those animals that are not native to here. You know, they go to the continent of Africa and start shooting giraffes and elephants and rhinos. And it's like, why? And shooting lions and stuff. 
And then it's not like you take it. You're not bringing it back home half the time. They leave the animal right there. They just took a picture for, 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 for Instagram. Maybe they cut off the foot and bring it back home. I'm like, y'all are just like, what? what is the purpose of that? Y'all always want to show how strong y'all are, but your strength only comes because you got some kind of weapon. And then you go and you target things that can't fight back or things that are not equally matched when it comes to strength and power. And then you you blow and gloat about that. I just that's weird to me. Somebody said we are desensitized, Calvin. You're so correct, and I hate that we are because it's not good. Because the problem with that is we're in a space now. When you hear about a school shooting, sometimes we just change the channel and finish watching whatever we're watching. Oh, I hope everything's good for them. And you just keep moving. And you hear about a mass shooting at this place or that place. It happens so much. You're like, oh, okay. E even again, what I cannot understand for the life of me. Remember what Christmas two, uh, 2021, I think, or 2020, the whole bombing in Nashville that nobody talks about. I'm like, you just had like a whole handful of city blocks just explode from terrorism. And we talked about it for one day and moved on. And, and, and when you just think about, let's go back to Oklahoma City bombing, right? That was one building. Up until 9-11, Oklahoma City bombing was like the worst thing. It was referenced so much because it was just such a tragedy. It was so shocking. Everybody knew who Timothy McVeigh was. I knew who he was, and I was like six, right? Because that you just heard the name and just how offended people were that that took place. Nashville happened. We kept it moving. That's America right now. They're sensitized to everything. It's not good. Because I think once you get desensitized, the effort and the, the energy into – Fighting to change things is no longer there. You just It's just become a part of daily life. It's become a part of normal life to the point where now, even when we're talking about school safety, instead of politicians trying to figure out a way to really kill and end the gun violence, it's like, well, let's just figure out how we can adapt and adjust to gun violence. We'll start making new gadgets and you know room dividers. You pull this room and it makes a big giant square and it'll hide all the students behind the square and it's bulletproof and we can lock the students into that. You know, just random different things now. It's like, you're not even trying to challenge the actual threat. We're just gonna live with the threat instead. It's crazy. Um, thank you, Maverick, because that perfectly proves my point. Thank you. To be honest, I didn't remember which shooting you were talking about. I don't keep up with the news as much with work. And the fact that there's that many shootings that you can't even keep up, because when you think about, you know, 30, 40 years ago, there's always been mass shootings. There's, there's always been a bunch of different things. But even if you didn't really watch the news like that back in the day, there were certain stories and certain things you still knew about. Everybody was still going to know about the O.J. Simpson trial, whether you watch the news or not, right? You know, there's just certain things. When, when the little white girl fell in the well back in the 80s, everybody was going to know about the baby that was in the well for however many days because that's how CNN became CNN, right? Um, those kind of things. All right, we're going to move on because I'm behind. Dang, man. Okay, I got to move faster. Um, Wendy Williams. Everybody's been asking where she's at. Now we know. They have a documentary coming out that is following her journey to sobriety and just rebuilding her life and everything else. Personally, I think it's a horrible idea to have this out. I think this is something you put out once somebody has recovered and somebody is in a much better space and they have their things together. And this is something you put out five or six or 10 years after all of the struggles that they went through. Because I think for somebody like a Wendy Williams who has a lot going on, that what she had Graves disease, she has, um, I can't think of what the other thing is, but it's the thing that made all her, her limbs swell up into her ankles and stuff became really swollen and filled with fluid. She has that going on. Is it lymphedema, I think, or something? I'm, I'm not sure. Um, and she has something else that's going on. And then the she already had an issue with cocaine back in the day, which she's been upfront about. And now it seems like it's also alcohol. And there's just all these different things. Then there's the heartbreak from the husband stepping out and having another child with another woman and taking all her money and doing all these other things. And then her son ended up addicted to drugs at one point in time. Like She's just had a lot of stuff going on. And I think she doesn't, seem better to me right now. So I was like, why would y'all make a documentary about this and put it all out there? Like, I get that people want things and it's, oh, it's, you get to see them be vulnerable and so on and so forth. And because I was looking at the trailer and I'm like, she's crying every five minutes and they got a shot with her without a wig on. I was like, well, whoa, I ain't never seen that before. And she's very like self-conscious about that. So I'm like, does she, is she in the right state of mind to really know what's happening? I don't know. Um, but I, she hasn't been well for a while because even when the movie came, remember her movie came out and then they had a, um, a documentary that came out that she did right afterwards. I knew something was off then because this was only a few months after her and the husband had split and were going through all that. And so that whole documentary she had then, she's like boohooing and crying every 10 seconds. I was like, this lady is not well, right? I It just, I don't know. I feel like 
you know, thank you for sharing your journey. But I feel like this is something you share after you've gotten better. When you're still in the in the rut, this doesn't help because now the whole world is watching and everybody's going to start judging. Everybody's going to have opinions. It, it, it makes me think back to DJ AM. Kevin Kessler Lake has this great documentary. Um, he's this director. I don't remember the name of the documentary. Actually, hold on. I might be able to remember what it's called. But if you remember, there was DJ AM. He was the... He was a DJ, and remember, he was in the plane crash with Travis Barker from Blink-182, but they both survived, right? And then, like, after that plane crash, he just had all kind of, like, psychological issues because, again, that's a terrifying thing to be in. And the scary part is there's video of that crash where, like, they're both on fire running, like, getting the flames off. That's some scary stuff. But, um, you know, he had gone through that. He ends up becoming addicted to drugs, right? And then he finally cleans himself up. And I'm trying. I'm, I'm scrolling, trying to find where I had this um, documentary, the name of, so I can tell you guys to watch it when you get a chance. Um, and so he becomes addicted and, and hooked on drugs and everything else like that. And then he gets hired by MTV to do a show that kind of showcases the experience of people who have. Oh, here it goes, really quick. It's called "As I Am: The Life and Times of DJ M." Right? That was Kevin Kesselick's um, documentary. But you know, so it's this MTV show. And during this show, he ends up going into halfway houses and going into rooms where it's stacks and stacks of pills and cocaine and heroin and angel dust and all the drugs that everybody does, right? And mind you, he's a recovering addict. And they got him there doing the specials and talking. And then the saddest part is when you think about how he ended up dying, right? He ended up overdosing. He relapsed, sadly. And one of the saddest things about people who relapse sometimes is, you know, when you are a real addict and you can 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 put all the you can do as many lines of coke and snort and smoke all the crack you want and do all this stuff. And you've just done so much of it that your body has a certain tolerance for how much stuff you do. A lot of times when people finally are able to be sober and they get themselves off, right? Sadly, a lot of times when people relapse, when they need that hit, when they need to get back to what it was that made them feel good in that moment, and they go back and they revisit whatever drug it was that they like to use, a lot of times they start trying to use the exact same amount they used to do three or four years ago. So I don't know a whole lot about drugs and the terminologies, but let's just say somebody was doing like, I don't know, 10 grams of Coke a day, right? Or yeah, we'll do 10 grams of Coke a day. I don't know how much it is, but maybe that's really terrible. But if somebody has been doing that for however many years, 10 grams of Coke, and then they, they graduate to 15 and then 20, and maybe they're, they're up to 25. And then they say, I don't want to do this anymore. I want my life back. And they clean themselves up and they're sober for three or four years. And then one day they relapse. And when it's time to relapse, they go and they try to do that same 25 like they used to back in the day when the body was used to it. And the body cannot handle it and the body just gives out. You know, that's the experience of a lot of people who sadly overdose after relapsing. And I, I'm not trying to say that's going to happen to Wendy, but I just think she's not in the space to really be having this. Now, some people are going to say, hey, they see this as karma for the kind of work that she does. And the, I am a firm believer of you. The energy that you put out always comes back in another form. But at the same time, I still just think this is a terrible idea, <laughs> um, at least for now. I just don't think she's well. And I think for all that is still going on, we don't need the cameras for everything. I get it. We like the TV. This is the challenge I had with the Yonla Fix My Life show as well. Great entertainment, but the idea of seeing everybody's trauma and people trying to live through their trauma and, and heal through it, and they're not technically healed, and we're entertained while they're the ones in pain, right? And then we start making memes about it, and we got clips and jokes and stuff, and people are still struggling and battling and everything else. So, like, think back to the girl who, you know, her she was kidnapped as a toddler, and then the mom raised her, oh, the, 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 the kidnapper raised her to be the daughter for however many years. And the girl finally was found by the real mother. And that, that was on Ayanla. And she was trying to bond with the new family. But it, it just, it was chaos. And it, it was so fresh with regard to everything that had happened with the girl. So to put that on TV, and then they got mad because the girl blew up on everybody about to fight Ayanla, right? Just, I don't know. Um, Toby Keith passed away. King Charles has cancer. Um, let me read the comments and then we are going to get to Tyrese. And then I think after Tyrese, I think I can finally get to a love. No, because I still got to drag Brett Favre too. Okay. All right. Let us see here. Somebody said, Calvin, sometimes you're too funny and I shouldn't be laughing this hard. I'm glad I can make some of y'all laugh. <laughs> some folks be picked. Some folks cannot stand this channel. I, I just want y'all to know. Sometimes I get some nasty messages. I'm like, why are you so mad? Just go to another channel. If, if, if I'm not your cup of tea, go find another one. <laughs> like, man. Like this one lady one time sent me this message. 
She was like, I hate your lives because you talk so much. You spend like the first 10 minutes saying hi to everybody. I was like, is that a bad thing? Acknowledging the people who support you? My bad. I'm sorry. Let's just jump into the news. And then she was like, um, man, and then you guys got to get up and get that damn tea. I was like, well, yeah, we about to be here for three hours. So let me go on and get comfortable. So y'all comfortable. I want to be comfortable too. Dang. <laughs> Like sometimes they be lighting up, lightning to me on them, them comments. I'm like, okay, some of y'all need help. Y'all a little too attached to this YouTube thing, but all right. Um, Deneen Grant said the verdict sets an important precedent, and I really hope it does. I really do hope, and that's in regard to Jennifer Crumbly. Like, I really hope that kind of encourages some of these folks who enable their children or whoever in their family to, you know, continue in violence because it's the cool thing to do, and we're not snowflakes. Like, I need people to be for real. Like. The idea of people just losing their lives because of somebody's ego or somebody's rage, and rather than dealing with their rage or dealing with whatever it is they're dealing with, they take it out on somebody else unsuspecting who was doing nothing to bother them. I will never get over to Charleston 9. You know what I mean? He had all the different things that was going on up here in the racism and thinking that he's being erased and white people are being taken out of the equation. And so you go and uh, go after a group of people who sat and prayed and fellowshiped with you. You sat through their whole Bible study. And I know, and you know how black churches are too. Like a black church, church has their flaws. But when it comes to a visitor or somebody that comes in there, especially somebody that they didn't expect to be in there, oh, they give you the, 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 the they roll out the red carpet for you. So I'm sure he got the red carpet roll out. And if they were selling fish plates downstairs, he would have been in a free plate that night. And then what did he do? Go in there and shoot up everybody. Terrible. Um, the teacher Buckner said, I live in Alabama and giving guns to teens as gifts is so common around here. It's ridiculous. And I'll say to that point, I don't think teenagers being given weapons by their parents is anything new, especially in a lot, especially depending on where you live. You know, sometimes if you live in a very rural area, you have weapons and stuff, because sometimes there's random wild animals that are going to come to your property when your nearest, you know, that area, like when your nearest neighbor is two miles away and you really live out in the woods. Those kind of people, I understand why sometimes their kids have weapons and stuff like that. Uh, and, and different things like that. But now we're in a space where you have this cohort of people in America who want violence, who want somebody to come after them, who are looking for the opportunity to shoot somebody. They can't effing wait. Think of all the times you see the, the, the Instagram or Facebook or Twitter post where somebody with like an AR-15 or something and, oh, you guys want to come and take my gun? I dare you to come and take it. I'm like, why are you that pressed to shoot somebody? Nobody ever said they're coming to take anything from you. You just, you're waiting for the opportunity. Or how many times have you seen an episode of Dateline I always think of this one episode. I can't think of the, the guy's name, but he couldn't stand his neighbors. It was like this older guy. I mean, no, he wasn't that old. He was maybe in his 50s, right? Couldn't stand his young neighbors. The young neighbors were always having a party all the time. And so one day he had had enough. He was going to go over there to tell them to turn the music down. But he went over there with his gun, right? And then they're telling him, like, get lost. What are you doing over here with a gun? And he's, I'm, I'm fearing for my life. I am afraid. I am so scared. I am so scared. And then he ended up shooting everybody, right? He ended up being found guilty. But his defense was, oh, I was scared. I, I feared for my life. And then, I'm like, but you went over there with a gun to go tell him to turn the music down. And you went over there with a the gun because you were hoping there was going to be some kind of opportunity to shoot somebody just in case somebody got froggy. Like, that's that's the nonsense we're living under now. So people are just, everybody's living in this space of extremity. We have a lot of people who, who operate in only extremities. Everybody's out to get them. Everybody, you know, is some kind of crazy QAnon elite left radical whatever out to go and kill and take all the babies and, and, and eat the baby's hands. And so we must be ready for civil war and to take the country back. And when we take the country back and we put Cuckoo Man back in charge, you know, we're going to run things. We're going to have our own government. So now even the conversation of Texas, we're going to secede from the union. I'm like, this, y'all are some crazy mother. Where, where do we live? It was not a good idea to try to lock 330 million people in one border together and expect us to live together, especially when the country was already founded on pillaging and death, you know, kill off all the Native Americans and enslave everybody, and then everybody else gets to benefit from the riches. Like, it's been a, this wasn't a good idea. Y'all should, everybody should have left everybody alone. The world might have been a much better place. Um, let's see. I, Queen, I, I know exactly what you're talking about, but I can't think of a quote. She says, Toni Morrison says something to the effect of never letting yourself get desensitized. And I am I am there because I remember 
there was a period where I used to really cover a lot of the unarmed police shooting. I kind of pulled back from doing it as much because I felt like it was starting to become, I don't want this to feel like a trauma channel where you see me pop, and you pop up and you know it's bad news. So I started to fall back from that. But I remember there was a period where I started saying I'm very desensitized at the moment to these police shootings. And then I had to like pull myself out of being in that space because if you get desensitized to it, that means now you're, it's become normalized. You're used to it. If you're used to something, you're not going to challenge it anymore because it's become your norm. It's become routine. Right. And we don't want that. So it's like having to force yourself to get back into that space and care. And I think the reason so many of us, especially when it comes to like police shootings of unarmed black citizens, it's not even that we don't want to care. We don't want to keep hurting. So we start finding ways to remedy the situation by trying to emotionally remove ourselves from that situation. I think that's what a lot of people were trying to do. And I think something about 2020 kind of woke everybody back up like, wait a minute, we're we, we tripping. Let's hold on. Let's bring this back. Stuff ain't right. You know what I mean? All right. Let's see. Uh, Kira said maybe Wendy needs the money. I'm sure she probably does, but it sucks that that has to be how you get it. That really sucks. Um, ouch. Uh, let's see. Thank you, Nerd Lars. Speaking of docs, have you seen um, the Bethann Hardison one? Actually, I have not, but thank you for recommending that. I will check that out. Her impact on the fashion industry and the fact that she is Kadeem Harrison's mother. Really? Kadeem Harrison from, um, Different world um, is amazing. Thank you. for. I just learned something new today. I see. I like that we can learn from each other. Let me write that down. Um, I'll definitely check that out when I get a free minute. I haven't had a lot of time to watch a lot of stuff. I was surprised I was able to get have time to watch the um, uh, Greatest Night in Pop documentary um, and the Grammys the other day. So ooh, I, I had time to actually sit down and watch TV. Amen. All right. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Karen, yes, you missed the Grammy conversation, but the good thing is when the replay comes on, it's the first topic we talk about. Um, somebody said they hate to love you, Calvin. It's fine. You hate watching me. I don't know what to tell you. Sorry. Sorry. Y'all gonna hate me a whole lot more when some of these projects start dropping. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Um... Dia Tammy said, very sad about Jennifer because she ignored exactly the signs from her son um, when, and still gave him the gun. That's just the crazy part. You knew something was off with the son and you still don't give him that, right? Exactly. Uh -huh. Calvin, did you hear about Dr. Umar's alien encounter? Child, um, just a good laugh. I don't follow him. So it's, if I hear anything about him, it's because it went viral and found its way to my socials. But I don't really follow him like that. So stuff that he has going, I'm out the loop on most of the time. Um, okay, let's keep going, y'all. Okay. Oh, all right. Oh, we're, on, we're up to page five. I still got five more to go, but we about to zip through this because Tyree's about to get dragged. Okay, Tyrese, let's go to him. I'm going to read these two statements, and then we're going to have a wonderful conversation. Okay. Let's see here, Tyrese. This was said a few days ago. Sometimes, now if you don't know, Tyrese is this R&B singer and actor who's had this wonderful career, but for some reason, every time he opens his mouth, it just runs up everybody's blood pressure. Sometimes I wish I was born Latino. I mean, the Latin community is grounded in family, loyal. And mind you, this is I'm reading this exactly how he wrote it, by the way. Um, is grounded in family, loyal, entrepreneurs, businessmen, and women literally represent the dream, the grind, the hustle, doing whatever it takes to stick together against all odds. If us, if us is black culture, um, was more grounded in these integral, and they want to use some big words with all this integral magical nuances of us, we would be dominant. I've learned a lot from the Jewish community sticking together, eating dinner every Friday together. I've learned a lot from about I've learned a lot about the Muslim community throughout all my travels in the Middle East. They have a father structure where they honor their fathers. The Middle East, the thinking in the mentality is that they would much rather have a son over a daughter because they know that there is nothing like the leadership of a father and a man being the head of the household. I have no idea how we lost our way. We can't get anything done and accomplished as a fragmented culture, insecure, threatened by each other. Mm -hmm. 
competitive. It's just, it's just the M. So I, I just made the sound. Mm. <laughs> competitive towards our own race, killing ourselves every single day. Frivolously, the majority of us black men and the millions are locked up in prison, which is not true, but okay. Whew, I can't wait to get to my point. Of course, we are, we are, that's how he wrote it. Of course, we are, we are beyond powerful, influential, and successful. But imagine if we all linked up like other communities have linked, poured and built up on each other instead of moving like fragmented and dysfunctional. We have what it takes, in caps, to take over the world, in caps. We are nothing, we are nothing trying to do it alone. Please chime in. Would love to know your thoughts on this. Oh, you're going to get my thoughts. Hold on. Let me go to your other part. So then he responded a few days later. The response was, um, and so now he's going to mix the, he gonna, we, he's bilingual now. The internet is undefeated. Calle de la Boca. Black and brown pride. I said what I said. Calle de la Boca. I posted my caption four days ago, three days before Black History Month started for your info, LOL. Nobody. In my caption, my last paragraph stated, of course, we are. We are beyond powerful, that's how he wrote it, influential and successful, but imagine if we truly all linked up like other communities have linked, poured and built up on each other instead of moving as fragmented as we are moving now and being so insecure and competitive, aka dysfunctional. We are the most powerful culture in the world. I do agree with that part. This is why they are so threatened and intimidated by the idea of us ever linking up. That part I agree with. Um, We have what it takes, in caps, to take over the world, in caps. We are nothing trying to do it alone, in caps. Please chime in. What are your thoughts? <sighs> Jesus. I'm tired, y'all. Mm. There's so many. I, I, this could have been a, a video by itself, but. <clears throat> All right, here's where I'm going to start. I'm just going to break down the pieces. One. I need people to understand Latino is representative of what you just call Latin America, right? Like, so Latino just means, it, Latino can be a bunch of different people. Latino can be Zoe Zaldana, technically an Afro-Latino woman. Like, she's presenting as Black, right? Latino, it, Latino can be, um, what, what's the actor, Coleman, that just got booked to do um, one of those movies? Um, I can't think of his name. Y'all know who I'm talking about. Um, Latino, you have a Miguel, R&B singer, Latino, black and Mexican, right? Latino can be all those black people that you see coming out of Belize, like Shine, right? The rapper, right? Latino does not have a distinctive collective anything. It's a connect collective of different countries mixed together. So there are some places in the Caribbean that are considered Latino spots, right? Latino can also be white presenting people that fall under the guise of Latino. So that can be Marco Rubio. That can be Ted Cruz right? That can be all kinds of people. So it's like, one, you're trying to paint this narrative that doesn't even make sense because you're just talking to talk. So if we want to talk about that, I don't know if he wanted to more so say, you can't even say Hispanic if you're just trying to go with the approach of people who only speak Spanish. Because the thing is, I need us to understand, because most of us don't live in these communities with all these people, we kind of blanket statement and think we got everything figured out. Understand, when you're talking about the idea of Latinos and business together, you're thinking of Latino families working together. That is what they do. Family-wise, they go into business together in the same way that Black folks do, in the same way that Asians do, in the same way that everybody else does. And understand that the Latino community is not a monolith. Politically, they are not on the same page and never will be. And they don't even really like to be called Latino, to be honest, because again, understand Latino means you're representing, this is representing Puerto Rico. This is representing Cuba. This is representing El Salvador. This is representing Belize. This is representing Nicaragua. All these places have different politics, different views. The only thing these people have in common is that some of them speak Spanish because Latino doesn't mean Spanish speaking, right? And so And understand Latino is not a race. It kind of falls under the guise of being an ethnicity, but it's not even really a distinctive ethnicity because there's so many layers as to what falls under the bubble of being Latino, right? And we're also seeing that same conversation even in regard when we talk about the conversation of blackness through the lens of that the diaspora, because then there's a conversation of delineation and who falls under what. So when we're going back to the conversation of Latino, and this is not me trying to tear them down with anything they got going. I just need us to kind of realize that Tyrese, okay. All right. And so understand, going back to that conversation of them being this just magical, super unified collective, half of them check the white box. 
Okay. They don't even want to be considered Latino. Some of them are like, I'm proud Latino, this, that, and third, cool. Others are like, I consider myself white. And then you also have some who specifically are like, I'm black. And that's all it is to it, right? So there's no like magical monolith Latino brigade to come out and do everything together. Even in politics, they're not on the same page politically. You want to really see a conversation of unity? Bring up the, the, the Latino collective and ask them where they stand on immigration. You're going to get 50,000 different answers because all of them come from so many different spaces and different experiences. And the ignorance of trying to put them all in the same space because some of them speak Spanish is, is the problem. Like y'all be trying to do this random thing where y'all think you understand everybody else's culture, which I'm going to get to in a second. And so the thing is, understand, every collective has their challenges. The Asian community has the same thing. We do that as well, too, where people are like, oh, because the Asian community got together. No, they don't, because they're not a community either. When we talk politics with the Asian community, that's an even different conversation, because understand, we all keep thinking of Southeast Asia. Everybody specifically thinks of the Koreans, the Chinese, the Japanese, sometimes the Vietnamese, maybe the Filipinos. And that's their definition of the Asian community. What ends up getting happened? So you're thinking of Southeast Asia. You leave out South Asia, which is technically the Middle East, and we see what's happening over there. And that's no disrespect to them. A lot of the problems they have are directly a result of United States imperial policy, right? And so you have what's happening in, in the Middle East, right? And so even with him talking about, yeah, in Muslim culture, this, that, and the third, I'm like, oh, so where do the black Muslims fall in this conversation? Because there's a huge collective of black Muslims in this country. But again, the idea of I'm going to paint everybody to be the same religion because they look a certain way. And I, I had dinner with them on Fridays and the father is the leader in the home. Okay, right. We've seen you be a father and we've seen your leadership on social media. So you would be one to talk. So even going back to the Asian conversation, Southeast Asia, right? You got that region. You have South Asia. You have Polynesia, which technically does not really fall as Asia, but they still get in that blanket. But those are more so a set of Pacific islands. Like that's Samoa and Tonga and all that. Like all these places have their own ways of doing things. And so people have this imaginary narrative of everybody from the continent of Asia just does things together and they're just in one room together hanging out. I'm like, somebody please tell me when you saw somebody from Kazakhstan, somebody from the Philippines, somebody from, from Indonesia, somebody from India, and somebody from China hanging out together talking about the policies that's going to work for the Asian collective. You ain't never seen that because everybody has their own respective ethnicities within those different blankets of what they fall under, right? And so if we really want to get into it, the problem is you have a lot of Black people who actually just despise Blackness. You have a lot of Black people who see nothing good with what it is that they come from. And so they want to measure up to everybody else. They romanticize the experience of everything that is not Black because deep down they hate everything about themselves. Now, they will highlight and celebrate the culture and the things that are fun. They'll gas up the music. They'll gas up the food. They'll gas up the clothes. They'll gas up the lingo. But see, that conversation of the poverty that is the result of bad policy and just America being America, they don't want to embrace that part. That's the problem. So then when they start seeing the outcome of how people who don't have anything may move in certain spaces, then this is when we start getting there. That's the, the crabs in the barrel mentality. That's the this, that, the third. And before you know it, this this why I don't do stuff with black folks because this community got together. We can't get it together because if they just, if we could just be like how they used to be, we I'm like, what world are y'all living in, right? Like, I, I swear. And so it's like, a lot of folks break their necks to aspire to have and be what everybody else is and what they have at the expense of their own collective, which is really what drives me crazy. And a lot of folks really are not for Black liberation, Black unity, anything. A lot of folks are really just in a space where they want the same power to oppress in the same way that white folks can. If they could have that, it would be the hell with Black folks because now i got some power. That's how a lot of folks move, right? And so the idea of always blanketing 40 plus million people every time your cousins piss you off and then you go and make these statements and try to put it on all of us. Yeah, because we just we ain't unified and we lost our way. And this, that, and the third. I'm just like, get out of here. Then the conversation of, well, because all these other communities are grounded in family. How many, if I go to Iverson Mall right now, I know I'm going to see somebody in there with a faded uh, Williams Family Reunion 1998 T-shirt on that they still wearing. Because, again, we're not going to sit here and act like black people aren't centered and rooted in family. That's all we ever really had. You know, now, listen, families can be toxic. Families get on everybody's nerves. But we've always been a family-oriented group. Think of all the times, especially, like, me growing up as a church kid. I used to love Sundays because I knew we were going out to eat. But I hated Sundays because I knew we had to go out to eat. And I had to wear my church clothes. You, If you're one of those kids that grew up in the church, right, you knew on Sunday when church was over, all you see are black families. Red Lobster, Ruby Tuesday, all these different restaurants. At the buffet, at the this and the that. 
all these black people coming together to do things, right? Like how many times do we look on Instagram or social media and you see black folks doing the, everybody got the matching pajamas, everybody's doing the dance, all the cousins having to dance off with the auntie to see who still got it, the Gen X versus the Gen Z versus the millennials versus the, the baby boomers. And then how many times do we see the videos where it's six generations together, great, great, great grandma still alive and then there's great, great grandma and great grandma and grandma and the mama and the daughter and then the daughter pregnant and they taking pictures and, you know, do I look like, you can't sit here and all of a sudden try to paint the picture like black people all of a sudden, we're just not family oriented. We're just all divided, all of us, right? And then when he started talking about the women of the, the Latino culture, just they're so business oriented and they just got the ambition and the drive. And I'm like, okay, we want to talk business. Now we had the conversation about fearless fund and how black women are left out of every conversation when it comes to venture capitalism, when it comes to black women owned businesses trying to get a leg up, right? We talked about how, when it comes to how much venture capitalist support is given to businesses owned by black women, before the Fearless Fund started, they received 0.0006% of all venture capitalist funding. 0.0006%, right? Fearless Fund comes out. They start trying to come out with grants to say, let's try to help these businesses that are owned by black women to try to help them get a leg up. And these are other black people. These are black women coming together. Keisha Knight Polian from The Cosby Show. Let me come and join this group with all these different people. All these folks coming together, giving these different businesses owned by black women $20,000 grants and every grants, not even loans. Here, take it. You don't even got to pay us back. We believe in you. We want you to thrive. And what ended up happening? Whiteness comes into the picture. Here comes Edward Bloom. Big lawsuit. Judge orders fearless funds stop giving money because you, know, you have to either give your, your, your fund to everybody else or it's racist against Asians and it's racist against white people and it's racist against the Latino community. So we're going to order a stay on you guys giving this money to these different black businesses. You can't do that. That's not fair. And that's still in litigation. It's on the way to the Supreme Court. So Mr. Money Man, maybe you should go ahead and figure out a way to help support since you care so much all of a sudden. Like it's interesting that people bring up blackness when they want to criticize you know what i mean and that's the the beef that i have it's like y'all only want to acknowledge blackness when you find something wrong with it right because any other time you're chasing after white women all day or doing whatever else you do or trying to get somebody that looks exotic and this is this is my my african queen and then she then you see what she looked like and you you realize oh okay so actually you know her family's actually dutch and she actually was raised in south africa so it's really a white woman but okay african queen okay right you know what i mean and so, and then, and then the conversation of the father in the household, and then we've already seen the studies that have already shown that black men are the most present fathers within the household. When, because again, when you start talking, God, I, I can find that article. I'm going to find it and make sure I put it in the, the description because somebody's going to fight me on that. Like, oh, hell no, all the black dads in jail and doing drugs, right? But there was a study that showed that black fathers are the most involved with their children based on things like taking them to the baseball games and being the basketball coach and going to the recitals and actually playing with the kids and checking to make sure they do their homework and making sure the kid actually cuts the grass and showing them how to tie a tie. Like, that's the reality. But because you don't educate yourself on your own collective and you buy into all of the bull crap, caught myself, that the media tries to spin when it comes to blackness in America, you bought into the nonsense of all of us being deadbeat dads and in jail all the time. And even if we had the conversation of being in jail all the time, you'd have to go to the origins of why is it that so many of us are going to jail? It's kind of like when people still put the same rumor of there's more black men in jail than college. That also is not true, right? But there's certain talking points that just keep circulating and circulating that are thrown out there all the time and people latch onto it. And so, you know, my thing is like, <clears throat> Long story short, you don't live in these communities. You have romanticized what you think happens in their communities. They have the same problems as everybody else. They have the same successes as everybody else. And the difference with all of this, because my thing is this, you see the good in every other community and you want to blanket them to be the greatest thing on earth. You see the bad in our community and that's going to be the blanket for everybody. So again, those anomalies that you see in those communities that are the good, that gets to represent their entire collective. That gets to be the face of their image, which is exactly how our media has operated, which is exactly how education has operated in this country, which is exactly how the narrative has been about different groups. But then when you see the bad apples within our community, that's the blanket statement for everybody. We, we just can't do it. We just don't know how to move and no, it, we don't know how to do nothing. And understand, I'm not taking away from the fact that there are things that collectively we can work to do better on, but every community has some stuff they can do better on. So to sit here and romanticize and then tear down, I, sometimes I wish I was Latino. Well, you go on over there and be Latino then. Have fun over there and see how they treat you, right? Especially amongst the white ones. Go ha have a good time, right? You know, go to Brazil and watch how colorism works over there, right? You have a great time over there. Um, and so just understand, they got all the same problems we got. It's just in a different language for some of these groups. So I'm just like, Tyree, shut up. Always saying some nonsense, right? We and the, 
Oh. And my other thing is this. You ignore all of the structural policy that has been punitive and detrimental to the Black collective, to the Black community, everything. We're not about to go down this conversation of the redlining, the Jim Crow laws, and the Black codes, and the convict leasing, and the sharecropping, and the nadir period, and the slavery, and the discrimination in housing, and the discrimination in jobs, and the discrimination in healthcare, and everything that took place in regard to even what happens with the water, and a million things we could speak on. And the problem is you want to sit here and criticize and judge the outcome of living through all of that. Because when it's all said and done, right, you can say what you want. You can get as mad as you want. Black people collectively are the only demographic in this country who have had so much policy written against them and locked into place by the federal government and by the state governments. Other groups have had different little policy here and there that works against them. But when you're talking about who is the face of oppressive policy when it comes to being the recipient, who is the face of everything is going to always be rooted in anti-blackness, that's us. You Just housing alone is a conversation. Housing alone is 300 different books on just how effed up this country is when it comes to black folks, right? And how that affected wealth. That's just housing, right? We're not even we're not even to education. We're not even to healthcare. We're not even to half the stuff, but it's like you being some wealthy celebrity living in your wealthy bubble world or whatever, and now all of a sudden you want to sit here cuz again, recognize when they start speaking this language of we can't ever do nothing, we can't do nothing, they're speaking to one demographic of black folks. They're speaking to working class black people that don't have anything. That's who he's talking to. He's not talking to Jay-Z. He is not talking to, to Tyler Perry. He's not talking to Oprah. He's talking to all of us who got to go to some job we don't feel like going to in the morning. Yeah, that's that's who he's talking to. Uh, community he no longer even lives in to begin with, right? And so it's just like, get, get out of here. And really, my thing is this, too. It's kind of like when people do the whole thing where it's like, yep, yeah, that's why I don't even do black businesses no more because they had a bad experience somewhere. But then they still go to McDonald's every week and get treated terribly and get terrible food all the time. Right. People got an attitude when you ask for a sweet and sour sauce, but they still gonna go there every week because it's convenient. People don't give black folks the space to be your convenience. Right. You don't give black people the space to be the convenience because you want them to always be the problem. So you're constantly looking and waiting to find something wrong so that when you find something wrong, you can justify why your anti blackness is justified. That's where we're really at with that. And a lot of y'all just run in the wrong circles. You run with all of the incels and the worst people in society, and then you let that become the reasoning as to why you don't deal with black folks. And it's just like, no, your circle is just trash. You run with all the wrong people. You spend all your time digesting a bunch of BS, right? You spend all the, it's like, it's like social media, right? It's like the people who go and everybody they follow on Instagram or Twitter, they follow because they're attractive. Oh, she's a baddie. She looks good. I'm going to follow her. Oh, she got a nice BBL. I'm going to follow her. Oh, her, she got a D cup. I'm going to follow her. Oh, she looks like Lisa Ray. I'm going to follow her. Oh, she looks like Jenna Jackson. I'm going to follow her. And you you followed all of these models and oiled up girls and Ariel. You can see the Ariel through the shirt and all this other stuff. All these women that you really just want to F, long story short. Then when they start posting their opinion, or and that's the women. And then for the men, you know, you follow all the ego driven, I got the freshest gear, I got the this, I got the that, and so on and so forth. All the folks that, you know, have an image that you want to have. And so then you get mad because when you start seeing the content they post, you're confused as hell because you have, you're not following intelligence. You're not following things that align with how you see the world. You're following because you're thinking with your second head or you're thinking with your ego. And now you're pissed off because you don't like what you see and all you do is saturate chaos because that's the world you've created for yourself. That's the algorithm you created for yourself. And so no matter what platform you go on, all you see is chaos and violence. And you're pissed off because you go on Instagram and you see 20 fights in some school gymnasium and you see somebody getting hit by a car and you see somebody doing donut holes in the streets and they hit somebody's cat. And then you see some dude beating up some girl and then you see some girl beating up some old lady. And, and that's because that's what you follow. That's what you chose to indulge in. That's what you chose to prioritize as your form of entertainment, as your form of, of leisure. And then you want to get mad because all of a sudden, because I guarantee you, those are not the same things you're following with other races. When it comes to that Latino community, oh, you're following the business leaders that you admire so much. You're following the Asian gurus that you admire so much. Ooh, in the Asian culture, they do this. Where they have a natural healing with the herbs. And if you drink this special tea, it'll cure your cancer. You're following that. But when it comes to the black folks, yeah, you might throw Dr. Sebi in there somewhere in the mix just to spr sprinkle it up a little bit because now you're intelligent. But you're probably following some BS. And so because all you see is BS, now you want the other 40 million of us to be in, in your scope of how you see blackness. Be for real. Just shut up. Like, y'all be killing me with that. Like, my goodness. Mm, mm, mm. Consume BS all day and then want to throw it all on black folks. Get out of here. All right. Let's go to the comments. Tyrese can really shut up with that one. Like, honestly. Shut up. I should have made that its own video. Anyway. 
I'm just really tired of black folks that do that. Like I understand, no co like no um collective is perfect. No group, and this is, and I promise you, I'm not trying to tear down other groups of people. Like I, I don't want to take away from their experience. But it, it, when you when you gas up everybody else, so you can tear down your collective and your community, it's really hard for me to rock with you because I don't know where you stand. And for a lot of these black celebrities, to be honest, like we see where they stand once money comes into the picture. They get money and they say the hell with black folks. They start becoming Trump supporters. And it's not. And, I, and when I'm going, when I'm always going in on Trump, understand it's not just because I can't stand the man, but it's more so what he represents and what he's been able to enable. And the idea of you know how whiteness is now. And when I say whiteness, I'm talking about whiteness as a power structure that destroys everything else. How whiteness is now able to thrive and breathe because it's been allowed to breathe and exist and have a space and not be challenged. And so when I see black celebrities get behind that and tell the rest of us who don't have, you know, we're not people that are living in seven, eight figure worlds. And if the world falls apart, we can pay our way out of it. You know, a lot of us are only two or three paychecks from an emergency and being out on the street and stuff. And so sadly, because celebrities carry influence, people run behind them. So how many times have we heard people say, yeah, Trump was the man. We had a stimmy. And I'm like, he was not the stimmy man. He didn't want to give us a stimulus. That was Congress. I know y'all hate Nancy Pelosi, but that was her thing to do the stimulus. And then when the stimulus was supposed to come out, they got delayed because Orange Man said, nope, they can't come out till I have a personal letter and I sign them so everybody can say, thank you, Trump. But that's the reality we live in. So now we got all these folks running around. Well, he gave, he gave us a stimulus, stimulus check. We got $1,200. Right. Not twelve hundred dollars when in reality, that stupid tax cut from 2017, <laughs> you would have had that twelve hundred had they not changed the tax code. Right. I can't wait for some people to file their taxes for 2024 and end up owing and realize because you weren't in a certain tax bracket, that last wave of that 2017 tax cut for the rich is going to kick you behind for some of y'all. I can't wait for some people to really experience that. I mean, they're going to blame it on what's happening now and say, well, it's all Joe. He they this, that and the third. But just people are just foolish. It's the stupidity for me. It's like some of y'all don't even try. Lord, make it make sense. And then I think back to Tyrese, because now, now let me just drag him for a little bit longer. I got more I want to say. Because then I think back to, back it's, this is years ago. This is like, this is still the era of baby boy, I think. Remember that time he was on the jet skis and he had like the twenty or $30,000 chain on. He was in the jet skis, but then he fell in the water and then he lost the chain in the ocean, right? Twenty, thirty thousand dollars just just going from stupidity. But you want to sit here and talk about being business oriented and having, you know, the father and the head of the household and leadership and your stupid behind and went on some jet skis with a thirty, forty thousand dollar chain on and then lost it in the water because you're trying to show off and you couldn't drive the jet ski to begin with. I'm going to make it's fifty thousand. I'm going to just make the necklace more expensive just to make my argument make more sense. Like just stupid. Right. Then they had a whole drug induced meltdown on Instagram. But you want to talk about the image and the leadership and the community coming together and everything. You want to end up looking half crazy. Ah, where do y'all find these people? Okay. All right. I've said enough. Great music, though, but irritating. Irritating. Just stupid. 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 Just, God. My God. Like Whitney Houston. My, my God. Make it make sense. Crazy. And my other thing. I ain't done. I still got more I need to say. I got more I want to say. For the ones who do the most complaining, those are the ones who never do anything. Now, I will give him this. There was a time period where he definitely had um, uh, like a nonprofit community thing in Watts. I don't know if that's still going. I will give him the credit for that. Kudos. But my thing is, there's so many people who always have the most to say, but they're, they're doing nothing community-wise, right? They're, they're, they're only there for the complaints. They'll show up to get a certificate. They'll show up for a photo op. You know, they'll have the day where they give away some backpacks when school starts and then you don't see them for the rest of the year and they come back again the next year with the same backpacks. You know, cool. But I'm like, y'all don't even uplift the people that are doing the groundwork. Like when I tell you I have such a high respect for people that make their life purpose to serve others, right? I have such a high respect for people who like their whole life is dedicated to community work. You know, that was me for 11 years. I eventually repurposed my role and kind of stepped back some because there's additional things I wanted to do. And what I had to tell myself was like, okay, you have these really big goals and there's no way you're going to be able to do it if you're this locked in with the center because the center really was my life. And I had to kind of find a way to balance it out where, okay, now I'm able to do a lot of things I really want to do, but I can still service the center in my own capacity and support the new people that are now my replacement, right? And so like, that's a great thing. But like, I think of like, I think of Guns Down Guns Down Friday, which is if you go to any of my videos, I always have a link to their website in my description, right? 
That is a group based in the DMV. Their goal to combat gun violence in the community. But that's not the only thing they do. There's backpack drives. There's health symposiums. They're having health and wellness days. When some of these sad, you know, these kids get killed in the streets and everything, they're raising money to help with the funeral costs. They're doing everything that they can in the capacity that they can to ease and fix the problem since the government just does not step in and support us in that way. And it's like those celebrities that always have the most to say, those are the people you're supposed to be getting behind and gassing up and blowing up. You want to talk about unity and fixing stuff in the community? Go and support Guns Down Friday, right? And, and, and the purpose of that organization is like, yeah, they know Fridays are the days that the most nonsense goes down. So they try to have things on Fridays for teenagers and young adults to do so that there aren't problems. One of the other uh, nonprofits I always support, which is also in the description on every video, Joyful Hands, right? They decided to take a global approach. They said, let's take care of two or multiple communities. Let's take care of the Black inner city youth or the working class black families and also Latino families in the DMV that need support with food. So yeah, we're going to have food drives every Sunday in Alexandria and you just got to show up and pick it up. And it, it's good food, you know, fresh produce, fresh this, fresh that. And when we have it, if it's cosmetics for like girls reproductive things like, you know, tampons and all that kind of stuff, we have that. You know, if it's health and wellness, bicycle safety day, we got helmets for all the kids. We got bikes for all the kids. We have all that. And then we also have school supplies for all the kids here. And then on the other, when we go across the water, okay, let's highlight this school in Monrovia, Liberia, where the school is not free and the kids have to pay tuition to go to school or they can go home. Let's see if we can find ways to raise money for them to have tuition so they can go to school and learn, right? So let's take care of multiple groups. Like you have all these groups that are doing things and these are started by black folks, specifically black women, right? The same group that you somehow want to bypass because you want to gas up Blanca and them to be, that sounds so rude, but you want to gas them up to be the pioneers of business and hustle. It's just like, y'all be on some nonsense. I just can't stand that so many people are so just misinformed on so much and want to be the loudest MFs in the room. My God. Okay, I'm done for real now. Let me read the comments. Piss me off. Thank you, Karen. Why is it that when Blacks shoot anybody, we're just thugs, but every time these kids shoot up anybody, they have some kind of mental health issue, make that make sense. And then we get the whole story of their whole child. Then they done went and shot 50 people and we got to get their whole story. And even, or, or, or if it's like the, the white guy that kills his husband and wife because the stock market crashed that day, the stock market, I don't know if you remember, back in 1999 in Atlanta, the market crashed for a day, just a day, right? The stock market crashed, I don't know, a few hundred points, right? So this man in Atlanta was so pissed because he lost the money, he went and killed his whole family. Right. But then when they tell the story, you know, they show the picture of the family the portrait and and everything. And that's the picture that keeps flying. Meanwhile, this man literally killed his family because he was mad. He lost all his money. And then he killed himself. Why you couldn't just jump out the window by yourself? Why you got to bring everybody else in? it? Like, that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. And so that is always seen as, oh, they were just having a hard time. We don't understand. Same thing I said when I have smoke for Van Jones after Cuckoo Man got in there and he was like, well, we need to really look at it through the eyes of working class, poor white Americans and all the suffering they had to do. And I'm like, well, damn, well, what about the rest of us? We had policy working against us. They did it. I see why they mad because they had all the policy in their favor and still weren't able to climb out of the nonsense. But that's how capitalism works. Somebody has to be poor. At least for black folks, it, it was written and, and set up for us to not have anything. So the handful of us that make it out of the nonsense and have somewhat of a decent living, all of us are the anomaly. And then still we're paying it to be, you know, work hard enough, you're lazy and you got victimhood. You need to work, grow and be stronger. But then instead, white folks can literally vote to put this country in detriment and run the country into the ground just for the feeling of being right, for the feeling of having some element of power since they don't have it economically, individually. Yeah, you got, there's, you know, we still know the median white household income is like 181K versus black America's 13K. But still, you got a whole lot of folks who have nothing. And so they want everybody to suffer unless they can get, you know, what they think they deserve. So everybody else, it's everybody else's fault that they're liking together. When in reality, there's no policy that is detrimental against white Americans. There's nothing that's been institutionalized. There's nothing that's locked in. And so what they look at instead is they look at programs that work to help uplift other communities that have been victims to bad policy that tries to kind of give them a leg up to kind of balance out the imbalances that exist. But white America paints that as that's anti-white, that's reverse discrimination, that's reverse racism. And now we're watching all those things be gutted. But go on, Tyrese. You go on and gas up everybody else because it's, it's, it's just on us. We just ain't unif we just ain't unified. We just ain't unified. All right. <sighs> I 
Um, just to see said he's definitely romanticizing Latino slash Hispanic culture. He definitely acts like they aren't they aren't all the isms and schisms with them. Um, I'm at him take his black behind over there and go and see what's up for real. Like he just mm. JC Latinos make the same complaints about each other that non-Latino black folks make about each other. There are many different groups under the Latino umbrella and they are not all united. Like understand like every community is saying the same thing. Even white folks are tired of white folks' is BS. White folks are cussing out other white folks. Like, damn it, y'all making us look bad. Can y'all get it the, together, right? Think of Thanksgiving. How many times do we see the tweets where white family can't even, they have to have 15 rules for Thanksgiving dinner. We can't talk politics. We can't talk culture. We can't talk because because the, they are not united, right? They all them on 15 different pages and they be having whole fights and Aunt Beth ain't talking to Uncle Randy anymore because Uncle Randy, we like, Every community got some nonsense going. Every last one of them. Just talking to talk. And then, and then the conversation, well, I learned this from the Jewish people. And you, there's black people that are Jewish. Like, you're mixing religion and ethnicity and race and nationality. Put it all in this magical super being that you created of how you want to see the world. Like, my God, shut up. I want to punch him in the back of the face. I really do, but he can probably beat me up because he's way bigger than me. <laughs> y'all got my back right if I start losing. Y'all gonna jump in? <laughs> Man. All right. Somebody said he's speaking for himself. I agree. He's speaking for himself. Don't throw it on up. We, we've lost our way. Well, go on and show us where we're supposed to go since you know it all so much. Because you you lead us into what everybody else is doing. That's not going to work for us. Why would he say, um, this is Primp and, Pro, uh, Primp and Pout NYC by Tokyo Co. Why would he say these things publicly? It's damaging to us from the perspective of other races. That's the other thing, too. Because then people will latch on to those anti-Black talking points and say, well, Tyrese said it, so I agree. Yeah, he, he said it, which is why I, I always have smoke for the Ben Carsons and the Candace Owens and all those different people who sit here and spew all these anti-Black talking points because then they become the tokens and the mouthpieces for white supremacy. And then you can always justify the nonsense because a few Black people got behind it. So even like Clarence Thomas is a very interesting one because we can sit here and complain about all the terrible policy that's out there. And they'll say, well, Clarence Thomas voted for it. I'm like, yeah, but Clarence Thomas, he, he don't claim us like that. Like, Clarence Thomas ain't never like this. He ain't like this ever since he was a child and he got made fun of, and he's been pissed off about it ever since. So he said, we, you, you niggas about to pay. That's really what he said. Sorry. Um, man. Um, all right, I'm going to correct myself because y'all are saying that study about the Black Fathers might have been a self-reported study. study. So, okay, I'm going to go back and ask that from the record. I'll see if I can find something else. If not, we'll just act like I didn't say that. But still, my point still stands. Y'all not going to keep painting Black Fathers to not be involved. I don't like that crap. Some nonsense. Um... That is fair. Most surveys are based on self-report. I don't think that invalidates a survey in its, or in, I'm sorry, in and of itself. Yeah, I, so I get the idea of like, there should probably be something a bit more tangible, but that's, that's the main reference there. But my point still stands. Everything I said still stands with everything Tyrese just said, so we're good. Um, especially with the custody nonsense he got going on. You, you would want to talk about Black fathers. And I also need us to, one other thing. Right. Even when we talk about the father's conversation, I want us to look at the conversation of fathers being more so good fathers. Just because you are a father does not mean you are a good one. Just because you are the provider and you made a child doesn't mean that you did everything else right. If you're not emotionally supporting your child or letting your child learn and do all these different things, but because you want to be Mr. King of the castle and I'm the father and I'm the king and that kind of thing. And so you always ignore those emotional needs that the child is craving for and everything, or even that element of nurturing that men also should still give their children or whatever, Because, but you want to just pass that off to the mother. Like there's some people who have households where the mother does all the nurturing and the raising and the father only shows up to discipline. And some people kind of like that approach. And I don't think that's a healthy way of being a father because then it's like your association with male figures and your association with leadership is just punishment. 
right? And so you become super authoritarian. And I think that's why we have a lot of these black public figures who, like I said, really what they want is they just want the same power that white men have to oppress other folks. Anyway, that's all I'm saying. Oh, uh, Miss B. Fly, I just, my friend just told me to check this book out too. Please consider The Grift by Clay Kane, um, a serious XM host that speaks history, civics, and current politics. He, he's actually really good with what he does. I just saw his book um, just came out. Um, I, I do plan to check that out. Um, Jarrell Anderson, unfollow the accounts that you don't want to see if that's, it's that simple. That's what I do. I, if it's some crazy stuff, I'd be like, bye, 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 bye. Yeah, I'm not about to sit here and look at crazy stuff all day. All right, here we go, here we go. Um, dang, y'all, I'm never going to get through these comments. Y'all in here going, in. Yeah. <laughs> Toya8169, yeah. since you got your degrees and you know everything. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's everybody says that. Lord, that's funny. Since you got your degree, and you know every good thing. <laughs> uh, I haven't seen that movie in so long. Um, isn't he trying to, oh, um, Reba Ann Buckner said, isn't he trying to sue Home Depot for not accepting his credit card or something? He should handle his finances before, oh, oh returning, lecture, uh, re-lecturing, uh, or I'm sorry. Um, lecturing others. All right. I, I, I don't know because he, I mean, he got his advice because remember he said he was in these different communities having dinner with folks on Friday. So he got his financial advice from them. So he need to go ask them how it works. This is weird. He made great music. It's just like, it makes it hard to even like your music because it's just your stuff. You you're just so outraged. This is like f that mf -er. man. Oh, speaking of Britney, he was like, yeah, this be the times where you have to separate the person from the music. And with him, it'd it be hard. His stuff because he has some really great music, and I'd be like, this. And you start thinking, like, actually, nah, I'd be, ugh, ugh. a mess. Karen, no stimulus checks mess people's taxes up. They did away with itemizing, and now a person who uh, runs a business from home can't write nothing off on the tax like they used to be able to. Exactly. Because, man, if I could write some stuff off, I'd be sitting on a pretty penny right now. Can't write nothing off. Even your charity work, you barely get anything from that anymore. Okay, I still have like three pages to go, and we're almost at three hours already. All right. Man, let's see. Oh, okay. See, look, y'all said y'all got my back because if, I might be able to get one or two hits in, but I, once he get one of them, because he, Tyrese's arms are like the size of my head, so like once he get about two, one, probably one hit, I'm done, <laughs> done. <laughs> I, uh, Calvin, sleep, y'all. Y'all better make sure I get up. <laughs> just turn me to my, just turn me on my side. When I get my energy, I'll try to get another swing, and y'all stump them out until I get back up. All right. Um, let's see. All right, let's keep going, y'all. Brett Favre, let's get to him, shall we? All right, now we've covered him a few times in the past, but we're still um, in the mix of all this nonsense. I'm just going to actually read the article, my friends. Um, here we go. Just waiting for it to load up. I'm on AP. All right. Ex-NFL quarterback Favre must finish repaying misspent welfare money, Mississippi Auditor says. Mississippi State Auditor filed court papers Monday renewing his call for Brett Favre to repay the state for welfare money that the auditor said was improperly spent on projects backed by the retired NFL quarterback. Auditor Shad White's demand of nearly $730,000 from Favre is the latest twist in a long-running legal battle over money that was supposed to help some of the poorest people in one of the poorest states in the nation. Favre, a pro football Hall of Famer who lives in Mississippi, filed lawsuits in February 2023 accusing White and I'm sorry, accusing White and two national sportscasters of defaming him in public discussions about welfare misspending. White said in 2020 that Favre had improperly received 1.1 million in speaking fees from a nonprofit organization that spent welfare with approval from the Mississippi Department of Human Services. 
the money from the temporary assistant for needy families program was to go toward a volleyball arena at the University of Southern Mississippi, where his daughter was going to be at. Favre agreed to lead fundraising efforts for the facility at his alma mater, where his daughter started playing on the volleyball team in 2017. Favre had no legal right to the possession or control of this $1.1 million, White's attorneys wrote in the court filing Monday. Favre repaid $500,000 to the state in May of 2020 and $600,000 in October of 2021. But the new court filing said he still owes $729,790 because of interest costs um, growth in, his, in the original amount he owed. It boggles the mind that Mr. Favre could imagine he's entitled to the equivalent of an interest-free loan of $1.1 million in taxpayer money, especially money intended for the benefit of the poor, White said in a statement Monday. Associated Press left voicemail messages for two of Favre's attorneys Monday, but they did not immediately respond. In October, a federal judge dismissed Farm, um, Favre's defamation lawsuit against Shannon Sharp, a former NFL player who's now a broadcaster. In May, Favre ended his lawsuit against sports, sportscaster Pat McAfee, who's a former NFL puncher. After McAfee apologized on, for on-air statements that Favre had been stealing from poor people in Mississippi, he was stealing. Like, whatever. Okay. Favre's defamation lawsuit against White is still pending, and White's filing Monday was a counterclaim in that suit. Mississippi prosecutors have said millions of federal welfare dollars for low-income residents were squandered on projects supported by wealthy or well-connected people from 2016 to 2019. A lawsuit filed by the Department of Human Services in 2022 said TANF money was improperly spent, including projects for Favre's supported $5 million for volleyball arena and $1.7 million toward the development of a concussion treatment drug. No criminal charges have been brought against Favre, although former department director and other people have pled guilty to their part in the misspending. Right? And so when we get to Favre, right, what's crazy in all of this, right, is I don't think people realize for anybody, and anybody who works in community work can, can share these same sentiments. If you've ever done community work, like you run a community center, you do an after school program, you work in a nonprofit, you do whatever. Even when it comes to just getting support from the state through a grant, if it's a state grant or a federal grant, or even if it's a private grant from a corporation, the amount of hurdles that you have to jump and the I's that you have to dot and the T's that you have to cross and the people you have to appease in order to keep that money and make sure that it's spent properly. And then when I tell you they audit and document everything you do, especially if you have a grant that is not unrestricted, right? If it's unrestricted, they're like, yeah, here's 20,000, knock yourself out, do what you got to do. If it's a restricted grant, they line item exactly what you can spend and how you can spend it. And then they follow up and make sure you've done it that way. Because if you didn't, then you could be liable for criminal charges or they pull the grant from you or pull the money and so on and so forth. But the point that I'm getting at is here we have this wealthy athlete who's had this, this, this thriving career in the NFL who's sitting on money. And then, you know, he comes into this money that is going to all of his passion projects, but it's coming at the expense of poor people. And the problem is, understand, like, all of that taxpayer dollars is coming from the taxes from the taxpayers of Mississippi, which, unfortunately, is also one of the poorest states, right? And so it's kind of like, you know, this is a state where the poverty rate is 18.1%, right? And so when you have a state that has a poverty rate where almost 20% of the, or one in five of the population you know, is living below the poverty line, understand there's not a lot coming in with taxes and revenue, which is why this is a state that has to get a lot of federal support. And so when you have a community that's doing the best that they can to, to pull themselves up and support, and then you being some wealthy person just get to jump in there and just start misusing and misappropriating funds that weren't intended for that purpose anyway, like that's a problem, right? Because think about like, we at this point get audited for more than $600 on Cash App with transactions. Now the IRS wants to know where that $600 went right? 600 bucks. And then we have somebody who literally has $1.1 million of money that's intended for other people, for people who need it because you want to build a volleyball gym where the school already had one. This is just to renovate and make a nicer one, right? And it's like, y'all are rich. Y'all have connections. Y'all can make this stuff without federal money. Think back to when that, that cathedral in, in, in Paris or Notre Dame or whatever um, caught fire. And all those celebrities, oh, I'm donating $1 million, I'm donating, donating this. And by the time it was all said and done, it was like a billion dollars in donations just to make sure that they could rebuild this cathedral, right? So there's money to go around. All you need was $5 million or whatever to build the volleyball thing. And for you to go and take $1.1 million. And then this is the same person that had so much to say in 2020 when people were, were protesting about the police brutality. This is the same person who had so much to say about, you know, a lot of the criticisms that people had about the NFL when it comes to race and how they move, right? You got all this criticism, but then here you go stealing from people, right? And then you want to sue because you don't like that your image is getting challenged. So now you're going to sue because people don't call you out with your nonsense, 
right? It, it, it's just chaotic because then it makes me think back to the fact that like, Again, even with people who are on benefits, they already got to deal with enough nonsense because they get judged by the world. How many times do you see a post where somebody gets pissed off because somebody went and bought some, a, a nice bag of shrimp with some food stamps? They'd be in there pissed off, right? Mad as hell. And, you know, my tax dollars are paying for that. I, I can't believe they bought lobster that day. Well, dang, what are they supposed to only eat beans and noodles every day? Can they get one nice meal? And then let's talk numbers, too, because I'm about to get this conversation, too. Let me show you where you really should be outraged, okay? So let's talk numbers in regard to, you know, what our tax dollars go when it comes to assisting and supporting people. Because I will say this, right? We, on average, as of 2021, pay about $13,472 in federal taxes, right? And then of that $13,000, about $518 of it goes to programs like TANF and the lunch program and stuff like that. But if we're talking about where our money goes, right? So if we break down where our federal taxes go, right, out of that, you know, 13000 what did I say? $13,472, right? 2900 of it goes to healthcare, right? Medicare, Medicaid, all that kind of stuff. Great. Wonderful. I support it. Let's make sure everybody's taken care of, Right. And then another 2,900 of that goes to unemployment support and labor. Wonderful, because even if you think that you're the ish because you have a job, who knows what happens? You may be laid off next week. Look at all the journalists right now who are now probably filing for unemployment. These are the things that help people stay afloat. And mind you, unemployment is not even like a get out of jail free card because you're not even getting you know what you were making. You're getting a certain percentage of something. Sometimes you have people who get laid off from a job that was paying them 100K and now they're getting $600 a month in unemployment. So it just depends on people's experience. And then $2,667.25 for the military, right? Military, military industrial, industrial complex. We got to go blow some people up overseas and make sure that we can keep the power that we got. So let's keep blowing up stuff and we'll be silent about genocides and stand behind genocides and, and, and everything else like that, right? So you have that. And then there's also the government. Then there's $1,700 uh, $1,715.06 that goes into funding the federal government and everything else like that. Um, that also includes state and local governments. That's also for deportations. That's also for prisons, right? $18.56 uh, cents goes to federal prisons, right? And then there's the interest on the debt, right? So that's $1,200 that goes into you uh, from your federal taxes that come out of your paycheck. Got to pay on the interest on the debt. 642 goes to education. You know, it's a little, it's a little low, ain't it, I think? Okay. That includes for financial aid for people, and that includes the money for K-12 education. So $409 is for college financial aid for everybody in this country, and then $171 is for K-12 education in this country, right? And then 560 goes to veterans, right? This includes income support, and this includes Veterans Health Administration, like the VA and everything else like that. So $276 for income support to veterans, $239 for veterans health. Then there's food and agriculture, $518.37. That's what we were just talking about. This includes $323.10 for food stamps, at SNAP, and then includes $61.96 for school lunch and other food programs, right? And then $300 for housing and community. This includes $119 for disaster relief. So think about every time a tornado comes and tears up everybody's stuff, or an earthquake, or a flood, or a lahar, or a hurricane, right? That's, that's the FEMA money, right? $119 of your tax dollars goes to that, right? And then $7 also includes for homeless assistance grants, right? Seven bucks. And people be pissed about that too. Be pissed you see somebody laying on the bench and you don't want to give them a quarter. And then when the city tries to put them in some housing, you got attitude about it. And then $259.80 for transportation, $39 for public transit, $12 for railroads, then energy and the environment, $115.77, right? This includes the EPA and this also includes renewable energy, $5.28 for renewable energy. And then international affairs, all right, includes $84.84 for the State Department, all right? And then the rest is science, $82 or $85 for science, for NASA and different foundations. But anyway, so this money goes in all these different pools and pots. But the thing is, you know, you'll watch people get pissed off because they saw somebody try to at least have a nice meal for themselves. They want to be, they want to be the, the food stamp police, you know, food stamp patrol. Crazy. I am going to pause on all of the other heavier stories I had. I'm going to keep it light for the rest of the night because we're already getting three hours and we just can't be on here cussing out everybody all night. So I am going to shift gears here. Um, thank you, Iron Will. Can't wait to see what you're working on. Plus, I hope another podcast is coming soon. Yes, another podcast comes next weekend. Not this weekend, but next weekend. Yes, can't wait. So please look forward to it. It will be, it will be wonderful. And yes, I'm still working on some other things. It's just I my my... 
plate is so full. And I, I, I hate it because I hate that I can't be here more often. But yeah, that but that part sucks. But anyway, um, next thing, Usher Raymond, right, has announced a tour. I think it's going to be a great show. Looking forward. I look right now. I'm being very physically responsible, so I haven't been buying any concert tickets. Like even even Janet announced another show, and I haven't even really jumped on that yet. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of people going on tour. Like Janet, Janet, Mariah has the Vegas. Tony Braxton is doing Vegas. Um, but anyway, going back to Usher, um, I do think that Usher show is going to be a great ticket. I remember I saw the UR experience in 2014. I thought that was probably one of the best concerts I've been to. What I like about the Usher show is that Usher is, in addition to just being an entertainer, there's a musicality that there that's there, right? So there's a certain standard and quality he's going to give. Now, I think he's smart because he doesn't have a lot of concert dates. I think it might, I don't even think it's 20 shows, right? And he's only going to so many cities, which I think is smart because then you don't burn yourself out because Usher also does not lip sync. He sings live all the way through. So I think he this will be a hot ticket to get to. So we will see how that goes. And then we know he's doing halftime next week. Who knows? Maybe we'll go live after the halftime and talk about what we like. It's going to be interesting because Usher also, when I was guessing like what his set list would be for halftime, you know, he has a lot of hits, but Usher has a lot of like mid timbles and slow jams. And I was like, well, yeah, because I was like, I don't know. My, my guess with what would work, because it's like a lot of his biggest hits are like ballads and stuff. And I'm like, people don't really want to hear too many ballads at halftime. They want to see the energy. So my suggestion would be open it up with one of the, the sexy Usher slow grooves so you can really showcase the vocals and serenade the crowd and then let the rest of the set be all the lasers and the dancers and everything. And I only say that because when he did the BET Awards in 04, remember he opened with, yeah, and they were climbing up the wall and jumping down and suspended and dancing. And then he had to sing Burn, but he was out of breath, right? Now, I think his breath control is a whole lot better today than it was then, but I just think it'll be really smart for him Knock out the ballad, or yeah, I don't know if you're gonna do nice and slow, or let, let me just pull up his. Uh, let's 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 look at the singles and see what we can get here with Usher. Um, let us see here, Usher singles. Let's see. Um, he's probably not gonna be performing "Call Me a Mac" or "Can You Get With It" or "Think of You" or "The Many Ways You're Coming for Christmas." You make me wanna might be on the set list. Not sure. If he does it, I think it would be smart to remix the song to just make it fit more so for a stadium event. Nice and slow is a banger. I'm sure that's going to be in the set list somewhere. My way, I think he's probably going to skip. He's not going to do Pop Your Collar. I think You Remind Me will be in the set. I don't know if he's going to remix, remix it or not. I think it would be wise to remix it. Um, you Got It Bad. I think you're either going to get You Got It Bad or Burn. You're not getting both. You Don't Have to Call, I think, is definitely in there, and he won't have to do much with it. He's not going to do You Turn. He's not going to do Can You Help Me. Yeah, will definitely be in the set list. Like I said, you're either getting Burn or You Got It Bad. I don't think you're getting both. Confessions and my boo. I think we might get one of them. I caught up. I actually think he's gonna randomly throw in the set list. I feel like caught up will be in there. Same girl will not be in the set list. Love in this club. I'm good on. He'll probably perform it though. Love in this club part two. Hopefully he skips. Moving mountains. He don't got to do. What's your name? He don't got to do. Here I stand is one of my favorites, but it's not gonna fit for halftime. Trading places. He can skip. Papers. He can skip. Hey daddy. I think should be in the set list. Or Lil Freak, one or the other. Give me one of those. Everybody hates on OMG, but I think OMG will be a great song for a stadium halftime experience. There Goes My Baby is another favorite, I think. Maybe it'll go in there. I don't know. DJ Got Us Fall in Love. He can skip, but he's going to do. I know he's going to do that one. Hotty Toddy, I did like that song, but they're going to skip it. They're going to skip Lay You Down. They're going to skip more. They're going to skip Dirty Dancer. Climax will not make the set. Scream might make the set since it's that EDM sound. Let Me See will not make it. Numb will not make it. Dive will not make it. Good Kisser is my favorite Usher single, and they're probably going to skip it, and I'm going to be mad about it. She came to give it to you. Wasn't really a hit, but it kind of fits for a halftime show. Who knows? I Don't Mind will be getting skipped. Chains will be getting skipped. No Limit. I think they're going to skip it. Crash was one of my favorite songs, but they're going to skip that. They're going to skip Missing You. They're going to skip Rivals. They're going to skip Peace Sign. They're going to skip La La. They're going to skip Come Through. Well, yeah, they're going to still skip that. I know that's the hit with Summer Walker. They're going to skip it. Don't Waste My Time, I think, has a better shot of being in the set, but I don't think it will be. Sex Beat, I don't think it's going to be in there. California's not going to be in there. I Cry, Bad Habits. Maybe he'll do Glue since it's one of the newer songs or Good Good. Boyfriend and Dientes, no. Transparency, no. Ruin just came out. I think he will do that one. He won't do I Need a Girl Part 2 with Diddy because we've seen what's going on with Diddy. Um, Lovers and Friends. 
I can see that in bringing out Ludacris and, and Lil John. I actually can see that. I don't know though. Um, yeah, he has a, a lot of stuff he can play with, but I don't know how his set's gonna go. I know they said that it's gonna like pay homage to the greats before him and everything else like that, and to R and B. So he might even be doing some covers, and I don't know. I think it's gonna be a very. I think you're gonna get a lot. You're gonna get some great musicality and strings and this amazing band, but you're going to get the dancing and the lasers and folks going to be getting shot out the floor. I think it's going to be a great show. So I'm looking forward to seeing what it is that he does. Um, so that's Usher. Let me see who else we got on here. Um, actually, let me pause. I didn't read the comments with after um, the other stuff. Let's see. Somebody said we're going in on them too. I don't know what it's about, but I'm sure y'all back me. So thank you. Um, Leo Johnson says, sorry, it was a study by the CD in 2013, The Truth About Black Fatherhood. Okay. Um, Sean Florida said, how is Candace Owens a mouthpiece for white supremacy, you said? Because Candace Owens, if you... If you wrote down every thought that Candace Owens has and you didn't say that it was Candace Owens and you just read the thoughts and you had to take a guess of where those thoughts came from, you would think it came from a white person, right? So in the same thing where she was talking about, the, even the nonsense of if I'm on a plane, I'm afraid because if the, if the pilot was a woman, I would be afraid. Like all these different things where she constantly talks down or the fact that she too wanted to say George Floyd died because of drugs, not because a cop sat on his neck for eight minutes with all his body weight, like that kind of nonsense. Candace knows what she's doing. She's a mouthpiece for white supremacy. They love to use black folks to go. And honestly, they love to do it themselves because they get a check from it. Yeah, she is not for us and never has been. But she will paint herself to be and, say, and claim that all of us are just stupid. And if we can think like her, we would be successful. I'm not falling for that nonsense. She's full of crap. Somebody said, throw Brett under the prison. Yeah, y'all spend all day trying to vilify everybody else who's poor or does whatever they do to survive. And then these wealthy celebrities can go and scam and steal, and y'all have no problem with it. Mm -hmm. Don't pay their taxes, and we, the taxpayers, have to subside or have to subside with them. Exactly. That's the nonsense. And remember when we talked about um, in that Nikki Haley video where how we talked about how like even black families back in the day were taxed at much higher rates. With their property taxes and everything, but then still didn't even get the same services as everybody. That's kind of where that conversation of even when we talk about integration goes. I think people always look at integration as, oh, black people just wanted to be in the same room with the white folks and, and, and be with them. I'm like, it's more so a conversation of if we're paying the same taxes and sometimes more than everybody else, then yes, we should be able to access everything that's public. If these are public spaces that my tax dollars pay for, why can't I go to them? Why can't I go to that diner? I mean, I, me personally, I ain't trying to go to no diner where they don't want me because I don't want you spitting in my food. But why can't I go to that movie theater? Why can't I go to that public beach that's maintained and cleaned up by my tax dollars? What do you mean I can only go to the beach on this random day for this certain amount of hours and then I have to get off because that's the only time black people are allowed to use that specific beach? Like that, I think it, it jumps into that conversation. Um, all right, here we go. Let's see. Exactly. But they have the nerve to degrade those who actually need the money. Where are the people who don't need it? Yeah, I'm sorry. When there are people who don't need it, steadily funding through the needy communities, all right? Even, man, what up, Raywin? Um, let's see. Do you want to know about one of God's promises from my Bible? If so, what word do you want to know? Listen, I grew up in church. My parents used to preach. I can quote the Bible like the back of my hand. I'm good, but thank you for sharing. Um, Actually, yeah, send me a message. Let me know. I would like to know what you were going to send me. But I kind of, when it comes to the Bible, I know the Bible very well. Very well. Um. And it's, oh, y'all are not going, y'all didn't let me go. This Mariah saw what happened. It's coming. It's just, it's not even me not trying to get it done. It's like I said, I don't have a lot of free nights like I have right now. I don't have the same time that I once had, at least for the next, like how I told you on the last live, don't expect nothing in January, like because January's book. We are at the cusp of knocking out some things finally where we're almost there. So it's like I have to, 
I have to prioritize that first because I'm literally funding it. Like it's it's money that's going into that. So I have that that has to come first because the longer we take or the more time we spend, the more new surprises that come up. And then I got to figure out how to finance and do other things. So Mariah is almost here though. So don't worry. It, it, it will be worth the wait. I promise. So you will be very satisfied when it comes out. And so will the new Jack Swing doc that comes after Mariah. Um, somebody said he's going to bring out Taylor Swift. He better not bring out Taylor Swift. She's our, Listen, I bet you Taylor Swift is halftime next year. If it's not next year, it's going to be the year after. If they don't do Taylor Swift next year, they're probably going to do Pink or somebody. But Taylor Swift is, des is definitely next year. I see it already. So, yeah, she don't need to come out during Usher set. Let Usher have his moment. Oh, I skipped Superstar. Well, that's because it wasn't a single. But, like, Superstar, you know, that that's that's our that's our favorite, right? I um I can see him adding that in there, right? That might be the opening. That might be the opening slow jam. I can see it. But yeah, he's good. He's definitely gonna do a mix of um his crossover hits. Uh, why do I think Usher isn't treated with the same reverence as Beyonce, i.e., social media chatter, stairs, ticket prices, um, or stands, ticket prices? Um, I kind of somewhat reference it in the Usher So What Happened episode, but I do think Usher also um. In the, the video I made where I talked about Michael and, and Beyonce, where people always compare them, in that video I talked about how when Beyonce came out as a solo artist, she was always marketed as a legend from day one. She was marketed as, this is the girl you must get behind. She's going to be the greatest. Like, you just, I, I even said, even when Crazy in Love dropped, and it, just her saying that, you ready? Like, let us know. We're about to be in for a treat. And so she does, like, you get the BET Awards performance. And so, and this is not to make fun of other artists, but it's like, you know, you have Ashanti who does her performance after Beyonce. And Ashanti has her name on the nice PowerPoint graphic and, you know, the rain sound effects. And she's doing her little cute dance. And then, you know, just before Ashanti, here's Beyonce dancing on top of her name. Big, bold letters with lights flashing, Beyonce, Beyonce. Her team has been really, really good at marketing and presenting her to be super great. Because to me, I... I've always seen the two of them as the perfect parallel of entertainment, where they're both exceptionally well singing, dancing, songwriting, production when they want to do it, great concert tours, you know, and they can dip and dab into acting when they want to. Like, I, I would consider Beyonce a better actor than Usher, but like they, they, they kind of do a lot of similar things. But I think also what kind of worked against Usher, unfortunately, was the whole debacle with once he was engaged to Tamika Raymond and how everybody treated her. And then Here I Stand was a, a much more subtle adult R&B album as opposed to what people kind of were aiming for at the time. People wanted the big crossover things. And I just think um, it's just a different space. Beyonce, I think um, some of it's team, some of it's just preference. And then I think it's it's a really dog eat dog world anyway, because then I think when you're talking about male entertainers, and I talk about that in Usher So It Happened, go watch that one, please, again, because it's like, when you look at how much the industry changed just between Confessions and Here I Stand and all of the new faces that popped up, there was a lot that went on that kind of worked against Usher in addition to the marriage and the bad press with that. And then that kind of aged him up. And people, there was a period where people were kind of looking at Usher like somebody's uncle, right? And now he's been able to really rebrand in the last few years where now it's like Usher's cool again. Because even when I went to the Usher concert, the UR experience, it wasn't even a sold out show, like which shocked me. I, it was him and August Alcina, and I'll say the show in DC might have been 80% sold out. But I was like, how is nobody how are y'all not coming to see Usher? Like you what? But um I just think and I also think Beyonce in, in the later years, there was more investment in what it was she was doing. And then you understand like Usher was under Jive, and this Jive folds and falls under. I think Jive ended up folding and going under RCA, and then this and then labels kept moving, and this person gets booted out, and then this person comes in and that person comes in. With Beyonce over at Columbia, Columbia has always had it together. They ain't never had no problems over there in Columbia in, in, in modern years. So, so look at all the other people in the big acts that are also in Columbia. Everybody's thriving over there. So I think there's tons and tons of conversations. And then sometimes, I just think sometimes artists, their, their career works in waves, right? So if you look at like a Madonna, who really, really massive in the 80s, kind of slows down by the time we get to the mid 90s and then has a resurgence and slows down again and then has a really big resurgence with Confessions and slows down again. And then Sticky and Sweet comes out and it's massive, but not like the other albums, but then there's this massive 
global stadium tour. Like, I think artists, their career works in waves. I think Usher's has been in a wave. I think for Beyonce, she hasn't really had a lot of waves where she's had a dip, unless you want to count maybe four, right? Um, and that's mainly because she got pregnant and couldn't promote anymore. You got to go take care of the baby. So I think it just, it varies. But I think the two of them are a part of a generation that falls at that last great cohort of entertainers that just get it, that, that know how this is supposed to go how you're supposed to put on a show, how you present yourself, how you sing into a mic, how you take care of your voice, how you polish everything that you do, how you just ensure that when you put something out, it, there, there's character to it. You're not just going with emotions. That's the credit I love to give both of them. All right. Anyway. Um, Are we talking so? I'm talking so, and then I think people also underestimate Usher sold a lot of records. Like, understand, not to and this is not to ch ch start comparing who's better, but understand, Usher has a diamond album. You know what I mean? Like, so like Usher, and when you look at like, especially during his peak when things were actually still going really, really well, like you look at um, 8701, um, two number one singles and a number two single, and then Confessions. Hold on, let me make sure I'm getting this right. I don't want to get this wrong because I don't like getting stuff wrong on here, and then I got to come back and correct myself. Um, going back to the peak, I said, we go back to that, 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 that window of greatness. Let's go back to my way. The second album, you make me want a number two, nice and slow. Number one, my way. Number two, we jump to the next album. You remind me number one, you got it bad. Number one, you don't have to call number three, go to confessions. Yeah. Number one, burn. Number one, confessions. Number one, my boot. Number one, caught up when at number eight. And then love in this club is like that last number one for a while, but just that, that consistency, right? When it came to those charts, Usher was killing the game, right? That's it's the same thing, even when people be trying to laugh at Janet. And I'm like, y'all don't realize that almost every Janet single was a top five single, right? Even when we talk top tens, I don't, she had 27 top 10 singles, and I think 24 or 25 of them were top fives. Like, y'all be playing in some of these people's faces, but anyway. Um, if you had to guesstimate how much was your average ticket for the UR Experience Tour, and you know, it's crazy, we got to go for free. Because this is when I was still running the community center. Our center, he, his people donated to us, and which was really cool. So I got to take like 30 kids. Um, and we had good seats, too. Well, we were in different groups. So, so there were some groups that were on the floor. I sacrificed my floor seat to sit a little bit higher up so the kids could have the experience. Um, and so I kind of sat with, you know, in, in the other sections. And so I don't know what the ticket price was. But like I said, that that night, I'm going to say it was like 80, 85 percent sold out. And there was a lot of people who were there that had like company tickets and stuff. Um, and then you still had the diehards. But it was an excellent show. Excellent show. I, I, I hate that there's not like a DVD of it. And I hate that it didn't become a bigger show. I thought that like me personally, I think that was his best concert tour. I think that's better than his tour um, that he had to support Raymond versus Raymond. Um, I think it's better. I think it was better than the Truth Tour. Like I thought that was an excellent show. Uh, it's just not, not a lot of people. Not a lot of people supported it. Um, um, let's see. Somebody said, "Let's be real." The eight situation. Oh, I forgot about that. Well, that that came later, though. As far as you know, the accusations. His music is about sex. People listen to his music, and they're thinking about the that. I I would. I think that's a piece of it, but even by the time those accusations came out about the STDs and stuff, he had already slowed a lot by then. He he wasn't at that same momentum. Um, let's see. Somebody said, could be out of the loop, but I feel like stands of female artists are more vocal and women are often made to compete. So that plays into it. I could see that. I do think with women in the industry, they do have to really overextend themselves because there's a certain standard that is set for them. Somebody just said this the other day um, with Ice Spice, because, you know, she goes on stage and just be up there doing anything. And some people are saying, well, why is it that, you know, y'all are hard on her, but then we got tons of rappers. Like, we can just talk about whatever Travis Scott just went up there and did. And, you know, you got tons of rappers who go up there and just do literally nothing. But the women in rap are expected to dance and have choreography and wear the different outfits and have a band and so on and so forth. It's like, you have a point, but that, the girls' performance still suck. But, yeah, I, I hear that. Um, so yeah, I do think there's layers to that. Cause I, going back, cause I know somebody had asked me about the Nikki and, and Meg thing. Even with that, this world of standing is so weird to me. And I, and I get it. I have my artists that I really enjoy, but when it gets to the point where it's like, people are ready to fight in the street over entertainers. Like, are y'all for real? You, you're going to catch a charge for an entertainer. Okay. Um, as far as the two and stuff that they have with them, 
I, like I said, I don't really follow Nicki Minaj. I don't really follow Meg either. I, I have a respect for, for their music and their singles, but I don't have any of their albums. Um, but I will say between the two songs, I thought his was a way better song. I didn't think Bigfoot was good at all. And I kind of was like, dang, Nicki, Nick, I normally expect Nicki to really come a lot harder with stuff like that. But that I, I was like, this is not good. Sorry. Um, and then the line on your dead mama line is real. That was real. Mm. And I get it. It's hip hop. There's no rules. So whatever. And some folks are like, yeah, well, she talked about um, Nikki's husband. And I was like, well, technically, Meg never said any names. She just talks. Some st- and really, that whole Megan's law can apply to a lot of folks in this industry. But um, yeah, so I um, some of that was really interesting to see. I think people are a little too invested in celebrity culture. And then with Nikki, because I even asked this on Twitter, and this is before... I think she even dropped Bigfoot because it, it, I, I think she it was like three or four days. I don't even follow Nicki Minaj on Twitter, but like because she had been just been tweeting so much for like day after day after day and going on all these different whatever she was on. All of it kept showing up on my timeline because I follow a lot of people that follow music and stuff. And I'm like, so I remember asking, like, is she good? Because she's doing a lot. And I, mean, I got cussed out by like 10 people. I was like, wait, I'm not trying to be messy. I'm just asking a genuine question. Like, is she good? Something seems off about everything that's happening right now. Like, and with Nikki, what I always found weird is Nikki has all of these accolades, right? She has all of these stats that I think she has some records that will probably never be touched by other women in rap, just because the the luxury of her being able to be a rapper that crossed over and was able to pull in a pop market, right? So she was able to lock in all the stuff. So then when I constantly see her have to brag and, and remind us about her stats or whatever record she sold or what it's, it's kind of like when you have all that you don't have to remind us because like you you have to learn to sit and bask in your greatness when you constantly are trying to remind everybody or throw it out there of what you've been able to do it one it makes you look insecure right it, it makes you it just turns some people off like we know you didn't get you got all these charting hits and we we know we were we were there we were there we we were there Right. And so I think that just comes off really weird. And then you spend all your time going after the other girl and where where her singles are and blah, blah, blah. And then the fan bases get to do their thing. I'm like, y'all, all everybody go outside and take a lap. Go outside and take two laps. I used to do that with the kids. Like when the kids were acting all crazy, everybody go outside and take a lap. Just just not because I wanted to punish them. I just needed them to run and get that energy out because there was like this big like square block. They could run around and circle the park. Y'all go out there and, and take a lap. First person back and get like a piece of candy or something. Right. And yeah, just everybody go outside. Just, y'all are doing a lot with that. But um, yeah, um, I would like them to really just focus on the music, right? Because I did say like with Nikki, I didn't, I did listen to the album that she came out with, and I actually thought it was pretty decent. Like I, I liked some of the tracks. I like some people didn't like that she was doing all the singing. I did actually like a lot of the, the melodic stuff that she had. She had some songs I thought that were cool. There was some song called like Cowboy or Cowgirl or something. I thought I, I was like that's fun, and the everybody's song is fun. So it's like you come out with a fun era, and you're about to go on a tour, like bask in, in your era and have your fun, right? Rather than spending all day cussing out this person and that person and going off about this and we this, that, and then we're gonna sit on the it's when you know you're the ish, you don't have to tell it to everybody. That's all I'll say. Anyway. What up, Deja? Hey, take out from London. It's 5:20 a.m. over here. Getting ready for work. I will catch into the live later. All right, what up, London? Um, Zylan artist said people play too much with Janet to me. They do. And even going with Janet, like when Janet got blacklisted, you the the beef I've always had with Janet, and I I understand it now, but back then I couldn't. Janet does not really address controversy. She will not indulge in foolery. She will let people drag her to her face, and I'd be ready to jump through the screen and beat up everybody. That one interview that I posted in one of those in the news episodes where they were promoting the Tyler Perry movie, and then the, the, the white journalist was, mind you, this is like three, four years after the Super Bowl. He would not shut up about the Super Bowl, and she had these suspenders on, and he was like, oh, do you have a, what did he say, a nipple thing under the suspender? Hey, how about that Super Bowl? Oh, and, and Janet already ain't about to pop off, so she starts, whenever she's uncomfortable, she starts touching her ear, so she starts doing this thing, whatever she's saying, and I want to be like, Janet, just drag him, girl, drag him, and she just won't do it. But I'm like, during that period where everybody was counting out she could have really been like, first of all, before y'all start on me, let me understand, like, here are my stats. Here are all the records I have that nobody's ever going to break. Like, she never does that. She's just like, I'll let the fans take care of it. And that's how it worked for her, right? And here we are, years later, her fans went and campaigned and got got into a space to kind of help rebrand her image. And then she got into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, right? Interesting. It's just like, sometimes just let your art speak for itself. Because the thing with music and quality 
every artist has that moment where the public kind of slowly moves on or they get into something else just because sometimes there's also just overload of an artist where you get tired of them or, you know, you just want something different. But when the music is good, when it's genuine, people will always appreciate it. That's why Tracy Chapman got the response she got at the Grammys, right? We haven't seen her in forever. She came out and everybody foaming at the mouth, right? Let the artwork speak for itself. All right. Oh, God, is Billy's gal on here? I, oh, damn it. I forgot she's here. All right, we got to change the subject, guys. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, she doesn't want to hear that. We're going to move on. All right, moving on. Money Long. Listen, remember when we did the Soul Train Awards review and I said that that Made For Me song is the one? I just love being right. That's all I'm saying. I love that that song has caught on and she's so smart because they've released the live version from the Soul Train Awards, which is really the version most of us heard first. I am happy that she is winning right now. That's such a great song. So glad that she's winning with that one. Um, and like I said, that song follows that formula I always bring up when I talk about like how that, that formula to get a hit, right? You have the in your face production that really stands out. It's a great, even when you just listen to the instrumental, it's really catchy, right? And when most of us saw it at the Soul Train Awards with the live band, it was even better. So, Really great, catchy, you know, in your face music. Then you have the really catchy melody, right? So that that hook it, nobody, dun, dun, dun. everybody and their mom has been singing that for the last two weeks. Everybody's making TikTok challenges. Well, I don't know if she's under Universal. I don't know if her stuff is on TikTok anymore, but they're doing the challenges and the social media, this and the parodies, and everybody's doing all that. So there's that. And then again, the distinctive vocal delivery. She kind of has a tone that's kind of hers, right? She doesn't really sound like anybody else. When you hear her, you can tell it's her. Right, which is why I keep saying these artists have to stop putting all those stupid filters on their voices, especially the ones that digitize their vibrato, because then they all sound the same, especially for like the men or the male rappers that do like the melodic rap, where they do that and then they all sound like future. Like it's kind of like you can't tell who's who. That sucks. But for her, on that song again, you have a distinctive vocal approach, you have the wonderful melody that's catchy, and you have the boom in your face music. You put those three together, you got a hit. Happens every single time. Um, so yeah, somebody asked me about Candy leaving the Housewives. I say good for her. I didn't know she was on there for 14 years. I'm like, damn, that's a long time. That, that's, first of all, that's a really long time, but good for her. I think she's fine anyway. She'll be, she has a lot of stuff going. I always see her like with 50 other businesses. So good for her. Bow out gracefully. That's the way to go. You know what I mean? Plus, I think that show's probably had its heyday. Sometimes it's time to let things go. I think Love and Hip Hop can go ahead and retire as well. I saw a promo for the show and I was like, this still comes on? Wow, and, it, and, my, and it's something just like the same people. I'm like, y'all still fighting every day? You don't get tired of fighting every day? Like, this is not how life is supposed to be, right? <laughs> that, like, at this point, Susan Network already has all the ratchet. Just let them do what they do with their shows. Love and hip-hop. Some of y'all are going in, into your mid-50s still trying to fight. Let it go. It's time to grow up. Um, let me see. I'm going to read some comments here. We're almost done, y'all. We're about to call it a night in a minute. Let's see. That is so funny. I, I totally forgot about Belize guys because I ain't see her in the beginning half. If I would have saw her, the child would have not even brought up old girl because she'd be ready for me. That's okay because um, if she and I are ever in the same town, <laughs> we better never hang out because you already know who I'm playing in the car the entire time. We do, we're going to be doing remixes and unreleased tracks and B-sides and live versions and all oh, we're going to have a time <laughs> just because. All right. Anyway, um, let's see. I just saw a question I was trying to answer in my chat just jumped. So hopefully I can find it again. Uh, I'll find it later. All right. Um, let me see. Somebody said, yeah, like Taylor Swift. I think that might have been where I was talking about that. Eventually, people kind of get tired of folks. I do think Taylor Swift is running in danger of being overexposed too much, too too often. And, and what happens is you start seeing the tide change. So even with like the MAGA folks now, you see them turning on her and they're trying to kind of go after her now. Like you, at some point, once you start getting too big, people always try to like say, all right, that's enough. We've had too much. It happens with every artist that gets really, really massive. At some point, people get tired of them. Um. Oh, the Beyonce and Janet alleged beef that they have. My thing is neither neither of them have ever said anything negative about the other after that. Well, minus the the, the statement Beyonce made about the Jackson family. But other than that, even after that was said, I think the next time Janet mentioned something about Beyonce, it was still something really positive. Like, 
neither of them have said anything terrible about the other. So I think sometimes it doesn't help to speculate and put things out there because none of that may be true as far as whatever beef people think they have. But then now that that's a public conversation, entourages get involved and then it ends up creating a beef that's not really there. That's kind of like what happened with Brandy and Monica back in the day. They never had a beef to begin with, but entourages and everybody else kept stirring things up. And before you know it, now they don't really like each other. And Monica's punching Brandy in the face before they perform at the VMAs. So like, yeah. Um, man. Let's see. Is it too late to make a suggestion for the book club? It is not, but shoot it to me in an email because I probably will miss it in this chat. And I might not get to see it in the comments because um, I don't always get to go back and read all the comments. Normally, if I normally if you're trying to catch me in the comments section on any video I post, you might catch me in that first 30 minutes to an hour when the video was first uploaded. Because after that, I'm probably gone from the video. I've moved on with my life and I'm on to the next thing. So, yeah, probably shoot me an email instead. Uh, Calvin B. Michaels at um, gmail.com, right? Um, did I talk about the lady in Michigan? Oh, that's the mom, uh, Jennifer Crumbly. Yes. When when this re-uploads, we'll have timestamps. Um, I mean, you can click all the different topics. Uh, a few more things I want to cover. Let me see here. Let's see. Brielle Knox said, sometimes the best response is no response. Nikki shouldn't have said anything to Meg. I, either that or I think what would have worked better for Nikki is when she would have just dropped the Bigfoot song, you would have just dropped it without any of the tweets or anything beforehand, like and not even announced that it was coming. You just dropped it. I think it would have been received better. You probably would have had better press. But, you know, all that stuff and, and aligning with Ben Shapiro, I'm like, he don't like us. What you talking to him for? But whatever. So be it. I don't live in that world. I don't follow them like that. So I'm not even as engaged with it. But good luck to everybody. Um Let's see. Oh, like I said on the um the the review I did, I'm looking forward to seeing this Luther Vandross documentary. Like I said, it's directed by Don Porter, which I think is so cool because, like I said, when I was still working with the magazine, I interviewed Don Porter in 2016 because at the time she had a documentary out called Trapped, which is really crazy because it's a documentary talking about just the attack that was on women's reproductive rights, and that was back then. And so here we are now in 2024, and we've seen how things that people once thought were precedent are now up for grabs and things have changed change in policy. So like she was a really cool person to interview. She's a black director as well. And so um, she's directing this documentary on Luther Vandross. I know it premiered at Sundance. I don't know the release schedule for when it's available for the rest of us, but as soon as it comes out, we talk about it, right? Luther is one of my favorite male vocalists, Luther, Joe, Tevin. Um, those are my, th oh, I'm going to that Joe concert this weekend too. I finally got a night Friday. I can't wait. It's the Joe and Tamiya concert. That's going to be a great show. Um, let me see. The Millie, I know we talked, we did a, a review of the Millie Vanilli doc, and I kept saying that I thought there was a biopic that was coming, and there is, right? The trailer is out for the actual movie, and we talked about the movie like two years ago because we saw the, the the promo shots of the two actors that were playing Rob and Fab, and I was like, okay, because I said the guy that looks like Rob really looks like Rob, so this is going to be a great thing. Um, that's I'm looking forward to seeing that. I think that's going to be a very interesting story to watch. Because uh, at first, the trailer that was out was only in German. And I was like, is this movie only going to be in German? But the, the English trailer is out. and it, So that's going to be a great watch. So can't wait for that one. Um, I'm also looking forward to the Michael Jackson biopic that's coming out. Uh, I see they got Nia Long playing Catherine Jackson, which I think that would be a fun – that's a fun Catherine. They, they kind of have those, 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 those kind of similar eyes, so I can see that. Um, so there's that. Let me see. What else? Speaking of – I think I already mentioned the old girls back on tour, but yeah, there's a bunch of folks on tour. And I think I've mentioned Mariah's, she's doing another Vegas residency. And then Tony Braxton has one, I, I'm not going to go though. Cause I need to, I have to be frugal in the moment. Cause like I said, I'm financing a bunch of things. So I'm not going to be going to as many concerts in 2024 as I, as, as in the past, or like I did in 2023. Cause I saw everybody, but this go around have to cut back. Cause I got to focus and prioritize on, the things that I would like to grow and come into fruition. So, um, but Tony Braxton is in Vegas. It's her and Sergio the Entertainer together. I saw Tony in 2014. It was a great show. I like Tony concerts because she's very interactive with the crowd. 
If you're lucky enough to have a front seat, she's going to come down to the front row. She's going to sing. She might sit on your lap. And then if you're a male, she's going to shake your wife's hand just to, you know, pay the respects. Like, thank you for letting me, you know, I guess give your husband a 10 second fantasy and you being a good sport about it. And she works down the stage and she calls people on the stage to come and sing or to come and dance. She has a fun show and she has a great catalog of music. So I'm sure that's going to be a great show to see. So good for her. They're also bringing back um, what Braxton Family Values or some kind of reality show that all the sisters are on. Um, I guess, cool. It's kind of sad because Tracy's gone. So it's kind of like I, I kind of want everybody or nobody, but who knows? Maybe it's a great, it'd be a great thing about healing and the journey of life when you've lost somebody and how to rebuild. I think a lot of people, especially as we get older, a lot of us are struggling with the thought of having to lose people that are close to us. And I, I think once, especially when you like get in your 30s, you start thinking about your parents' mortality and stuff. Right. And so like, who knows, maybe that would be a great um, segue into just healing, especially with, with families that have a lot of tra challenges and drama. OK, that is all my topics. So I'm going to do a few quick comments in the chat and then we're going to call it a night because it's already been three hours and some change. I appreciate y'all for hanging with me on a Tuesday night, because like I said, my normal live nights are normally Sundays and Thursdays. If I do them, I don't like doing Mondays because it's too early in the week. I hate Tuesdays because Tuesdays, I still got to get up early to go to work on Wednesday. Um, but yeah, so be it. Somebody said, Ice Spice has no talent. Yeah, she's not for me, but for the audiences that like her, go for it. I will say, I like the production on, what was it, the, the, the Boys a Liar song, but that's only because it kind of reminded me of an ice cream truck. I was like, this sounds fun. But yeah, she's not for me. But I did like that song. Um, Queen said, deploying your fans and giving green lights is something very different. I 100% agree. Let me see. Oh, y'all are cooking this lady. Oh, Lord. Y'all about to have the fan bases cutting me deep in the comments by tomorrow. I do think, too, I, I do think as an artist, yeah, you probably, I don't know. Your fans should get behind you for the music and what you bring to the stage and what you do with the videos and all. And I think when it gets to the point where, you know, it, it's I, I think this was a rumor. I don't remember if this was true or not. But the idea of the fact that, you know, people's grave sites have to be protected is a problem. That's when people have gotten so obsessed with celebrity that they're. I, I do think there is a cohort of people who live vicariously through celebrities, right? To the point where they have nothing else. And it's because one, I don't know if they're still trying to figure themselves out and they don't see the value with their own life. And so their identity becomes how hard they go for another entertainer or celebrity. Because there are some people who really go like super hard for some of these celebrities. And like I said, they are willing to catch a charge. They are willing to go to jail. They, they will pull up to somebody's house and tell you to come outside because you said that somebody's album sucked. Like they're that serious about it. And it's like, because it's like, yeah, you have no sense of self and you're not centered in anything because you've made your entire existence centered around some celebrity that doesn't even know you, right? Very weird. And there's some people who are like that where they're not, it's not even a loyalty to the artist. It's just a loyalty to that entire kind of space. And so maybe that artist pisses them off and they jump ship and go to another artist and then go just as hard. And now they're going after that artist with how much they hate them and they fight all the fan bases. Like it's weird out here in these streets. I, like, and I'm saying that as somebody who used to be in the music forums when I was a teenager. Like, one of the things I was talking to somebody about the other day, too, what's so cool about YouTube, so many of us YouTube people all either used to be in the same spaces. Maybe we don't necessarily know each other, but a lot of us used to all post on the same music forums or, you know, a lot of us used to be on live journal a lot of us used to be on blurry a lot of us used to be on hip-hop daily a lot of us used to be on all hiphop.com a lot of us especially the ones that talk music a lot of folks was on the janet forum a lot of folks was on the brandy forum a lot of folks was on the tlc forum a lot of folks was on, I, I don't know i don't know too many people that want to usher one but there are folks that are on it but like there's a lot of people on youtube where all of us knew each other or at least knew of each other or were in the same spaces this time 20 years ago but we were all just like 17 year olds or however old we all were right it's, it's kind of crazy like um and i think i said that like when i was on the um scotty by nature's channel when i did his show and we realized that we had both been posting on the same forum for years back when we were a lot younger like when we were in our early 20s it's like that was you yeah i was so really wow right and so it's like there's tons of people who have now all grown into different things and, and grown into these big platforms so it's kind of cool that we all indirectly all came out of the same spaces 
Um, let's see. Somebody said, uh, oh, Belize got mute your computer for one second. Somebody said, Janet faced a bunch of backlash uh, for 10 years, but has never gone on about it. Because even in the documentary, she ain't even talk about it like that. She, you know, they brushed over it and, and, and kept it moving. I think sometimes for your peace of mind, you just move on from the nonsense. You don't sit and saturate and stuff all the time because what's the point? Like the damage is done. It's, it's there. Now, I'm not going to lie. When she told all of us to let the stuff with Justin go and we're, we've moved on now, I, I was like, if you say so, fine, whatever. I, I Fine, fine. That's what you want to do. <laughs> but um, yeah, I get it. You get to a certain point where it's like, yeah, that was 20 years ago. Somebody said, I'm glad Mooney Money. I keep saying Mooney Long. Money Long made for me is a hit. And that's a great, it's a great song. And I, it's to me, that's like great RB music. Like I keep telling y'all, when I think of RB, the first song that always comes to my head is, is Faith Evans as soon as I get home or Joe I Wanna Know. Right. Those are like my two reference songs. And, and lately it's been Tevin Campbell. Can you look, could you learn to love? I think that song doesn't get enough praise. We, we, we love, can we talk? We love it. But in addition, could you learn to love? Is this just wonderful, wonderful R and B ballad. I even think the vocal is better than can we talk? Great song. Uh, but I think of those kind of songs and I feel like the money long song kind of falls in that same Kind of production style where it kind of it's reminiscent of late '90s, early 2000s R&B. That's what makes me like it. Yeah, they say Candy quit in Real Housewives of Atlanta. I like Candy. I like Candy because she be like here all the time. She be real level headed. Mine's when you piss her off, then she be ready to fight. But she's real. Um, she's always been really chill. So I've always really liked Candy. Oh, Jalil, 1814. Yeah, he, he, he's actually right. Belize, I'll mute one more time, please. Um, yeah, Janet technically has 28 top 10 hits because her Albert's Diamonds was a top 10 hit, but she's not credited on the song as it being hers. So really, technically, yeah, 28. And if we want to be real petty, she's also on PYT. <laughs> right? Um, let's see. All right, Belize, guy, you can unmute. Um... Let's see. Charlene McKinney said, I hope this documentary on Luther will deal with his sexuality in a mature, respectful manner. Honestly, they probably won't talk about it. Um, I think, and, and and to be fair, because that's something he was never comfortable sharing, if, he, if they didn't talk about it, I think that's fine. I feel like if that was his wishes, you know, just because he's dead doesn't mean we just go and intrude and do whatever we want. So, you know, I don't think they're going to probably address it. Because really, it let it be about the music. Because the music alone, there's just so much that was he contributed. You know what I mean? I mean, everything from Sesame Street to working with, you know, David Bowie. And then, you know, being in Change and working with Roberta Flack and doing work with Dionne Warwick and doing work with Aretha and doing work with Patty and doing work with Whitney. Like, working with everybody and everything. So there's so much that could be said that that wouldn't even have to be a thing you could spend all day focusing on if that's what his family wishes. Um... Thank you, Brielle. See, Brielle knows. She said she was just listening to Learned Love um, earlier, like a few nights ago. I just think that's a great, that's such a great song. Pretty RJ444, Case Happily, Happily Ever After is a really good one, too. I love the bridge on that song. It's a great bridge. Um, Excellent bridge. Let's see. We're about to call it a night. This has been a dope live. I, I think I covered it. There was one subject topic that I skipped. I'll save it for later. And it was just because it was going to be another hour on here. We ain't got that kind of time tonight. I was about to get in my pocket and just start dragging some more people. But I think we've done enough dragging. It's, it's Black History Month. We're supposed to be happy. We're supposed to be celebrating. Right? Um, Reba Ann Buckner said, planning to see Diana Ross later this month. I got to see her in concert. I took my godmom. Actually, Diana Ross was the next to the last concert I saw before the pandemic started. I took my godmom to see Diana Ross when she was at the Kennedy Center. I think that was like January or February of 2020. And then we went and there was a Lauryn Hill show like the first week of March, I think. Right? It was like a Black Girls Rock event at the Kennedy Center and Lauryn Hill was the headliner. And then I think literally the next week the country shut down or maybe two weeks later. But Diana was, a, it was great. I was happy that I at least got to say that I've seen her. You know, and she still does her Diana thing where she's going to come with the, 
the big gowns and the sequins and the the, the 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 hair and all the Diana things that make Diana Diana and great in great voice. And it was cool because she was singing with the National Symphony Orchestra for this concert. So she had a whole orchestra playing with her, which was really, really cool. So that was a great show. It was interesting because the majority of the crowd was 60 and up. But what was cool was it's kind of like watching these people turn into teenagers all over again or young adults. I mean, you had grown men in there crying. like, And I mean like 60, 70 year old white men crying, you know, when she was singing some of these songs. So it's like, okay. And I mean, I loved watching the black folks that came in there because black folks came in there like dressed down. I mean, there they were chinchillas and minks and, you know, aunties had on the sheer, you know, when they wear them, them shirts, they got the sleeves that be hanging out of sheer and the, the pearls and all the stuff and hats and French rolls. And I'm like, like everybody just, I love seeing like older black couples go to concerts because they always look so nice. They always look so good. And you know, you always get that cool cat uncle that got on kind of like that, 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 I don't know what you call it, but it's kind of like that, that cotton suit where it's like the button down with the short sleeves and those pants that it's like the wind blows and everything moves. It's almost like that outfit you wear to the beach kind of, and he got on the brown uh, Stacey Adams to go with it. And he might have that, that, that hat with the feather, but go ahead. Unk. Like I always love seeing those black couples. So that was a really fun concert. It was a great show. And like I said, she was in really good voice. Um, so that was a good show. Yeah. Um, after Tamia and Joe on Friday, I have no other concerts I'm going to for a while. But um, yeah, there's a lot of people that are out on the road that I think those are going to be some good shows. So we'll see how all of that goes. All right, I will hang for three more minutes and then we're going to get off. Let me set my timer here. I'm acting like I ain't got to get up in the morning. Um, yeah, so great, great concert. Oh, God, let me see. <laughs> Aunt Monique is going to be on Club Shay Shay tomorrow. Get ready. It's about to go down. I hope you watch it. I didn't even know that, but I certainly will watch. I really want Monique to find her joy because, like, Monique to me is a part of childhood nostalgia. Like, I love watching old episodes of the Parkers because she just, she has, when, like, when she's in a really good space, she has this warm energy that's just very reassuring like i miss the days of her hosting the bet awards and stuff because she was just fun she's funny like and she's silly and i hate that the industry has burned her so bad where you know she's just scarred and i'm glad that she's getting her redemption but i want her to find her joy again because uh, a happy monique is a very funny monique and a monique that you really get behind um but yeah i, I really enjoy monique the Tamia and Joe show. The two show songs I know I want to hear for sure. The song I really want to hear from Tamia is Become Us. I don't know if she's going to sing it or not, but that's the album on, or that's the song on the Between Friends album. That's one of my favorite Tamia songs. I thought, I just, I think that's such a great song. And um, for Joe, God, I don't know what my favorite Joe song is because he has so many. It might be Love Scene. It might be Love Scene. Could, could be I Want to Know. He has some other like album cuts I really like. I always like we need to we need to move or we need to roll. I won't let him hurt you. Oh, my love is a, is a favorite one. Um I like Mary Jane. He has some really I like Baby. He has a lot of really good songs. People sleep on Joe, especially as a vocalist. But um yeah, that is he is an excellent talent. So that's going to be a really great show. And I've already practiced that, you know, that to me, a line there, it's got 850 steps. I've been practicing just in case she'd be like, oh, y'all got to come do it. So I, I got step, step. So I'm, oh, I got that, 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 that. Oh, I'm ready. I'm like, ah, that, ah. oh, I'm going to have it down at that concert. I'm ready. So, <laughs> man, I can't wait. That's like, that would be the first night I've had to like really just relax and not be stressed out about all these projects and assignments and, and trying to just make sure that everything is perfect. So I can't wait. Um, that's going to be fun. And they have a second show. Like I'm going to the one on the night, but they have a Valentine's Day show too. So, um, uh, for people who want to go in DC, there you go. You can go to the Valentine's Day one. I don't know if, I think my show sold out already. I don't know, but they, they got two shows. So that'd be cool. Um, Raynette, the episode of the Breakfast Club has resurfaced where she goes off on Charlemagne the God for labeling her donkey of the day, which he was really stupid for. Like I, I get if there was one argument that you wanted to make with her and the the Netflix boycott, maybe I think maybe the ask should have been I'm asking you all to boycott all the comedy specials on Netflix. Oh, that's my time. But you know, maybe she 
I think it would have been better received if it was like I'm asking all of you to boycott any comedy on comedy special on Netflix and, and then she says why because I think the idea of telling everybody to just cancel the whole thing I think turned some folks off because we're really not in this era where people really are successful at boycotting anymore anyway because nobody wants to be inconvenienced and for people who have gotten rid of their cable and Netflix is their own their only form of entertainment it just it became that but Charlemagne is out of pocket like trying to mock her in that situation because she actually did have a viable argument and I, I'm glad she dragged him because you know she can cook you real bad and do it with love <laughs> and then call your brother afterwards so um, I was 10 toes down with Malik on that one. Um, somebody said, I don't know if you've seen her live on tour lately, but she has a lot of her joy back. She's amazing. The good thing is she didn't let them take her joy, but she's standing on business and telling the truth. Yeah, so good for her. I want to see her be able to um, really just get her things. Because if, if you are in my same age group, like she kind of raised some of us as far as TV. I just think of like, you know, those Monday, I think it was Monday nights on UPN. Maybe it was Monday or Thursdays, but like that, that, that Moesha Parker's, I think Girlfriends was next in the mix, one on one. That, that whole era, I remember like that being family time for us after dinner and watching those shows and laughing and stuff. So, you know, she has a special place in my heart. All right. Anyway, I'm off this thing. This has been really dope. I appreciate y'all for hanging with us tonight. God willing, you'll see me after, who knows, maybe we'll do another live and just talk about halftime. It's still at the NFL around here, but I do want to support Usher. So, um, yeah. All right. So we're out of here. Good night, folks. Stay safe. Stay sane and mind your business so you can age well. All right. I'm out. See you. Good night.